Hello, 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 folks. How are we doing today? I don't know about you all, but it is a beautiful, beautiful Sunday afternoon where I live. And right after this stream, I'm going to be going outside. <laughs> I hope everybody's having a great weekend so far. And I hope y'all were able to have a fun and productive week. We're going to get started here in about one minute. Alrighty, the timer is ticking down. <laughs> hey there, T Money. Hello, party people, indeed. <laughs> Hope you had a good week there, T Money. Alrighty. Well, it is time to get started. So I'm going to switch my camera here. Alrighty. Hi, folks. Why is my camera tilted? Hang on. There we go. That's better. <laughs> hey, weekend. How's it going? <laughs> I hope you're having a good week so far. Hey, Raz Wonders. Hey, Parasocial. <laughs> 21. Happy Sunday, indeed. <laughs> well, you know what? The, the, a member of the community has actually made me some uh, some music, which I really need to get up in my intro because it's pretty dope. Um, I, I have been playing around with it, trying to get it aligned properly with my intro, and I just need to finish doing that because it's such a dope track. <laughs> Although I don't think I could ever be as hype as Leon, honestly. Um, you know, I feel like we, Leon and I complement each other really well. Like Leon is super hype and I'm a little bit more chill. And I think, I think we, I think we complement each other pretty well. Hey, Kalra, welcome to the stream. Good to have you here. So I hope everybody had a good week. Um, and, uh, I was, like I was saying before, I mean, honestly, it's a beautiful day outside right now where I live. So I wouldn't, you know. We're going to go our three hours, but we'll probably cut it off right at three hours today because uh, I, I want to go outside. <laughs> I want to be here with you, and then I want to go outside. All right, and so what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be sort of continuing our um, coverage of React. Um, so we are now in part three of our series, however. Um, don't feel, um, you know, if you're just joining us for the first time today, that's perfectly fine. Um, you can find the previous uh, VODs in the series um, right here on my Twitch channel. Uh, if you go to the videos tab, you'll see parts one and two um, right there on the channel. And uh, this stream is, you know, beginner friendly, so we're going to take it slow. Um, we're, what, we're, what essentially we're doing is we are going through the modern React docs uh, and just kind of talking through the lessons and the concepts together. Uh, and learning, you know, what React is all about, how what it is, what it's for, how to use it. Um, oh, uh, captions, yeah, that suddenly started working again. <laughs> I don't think I've used captions on the last couple streams, and I do apologize. Um, you know, I know YouTube has a closed captioner um, that you can use, but let me just get that going real quick. Give me just a moment. Uh, I don't know that I've, I don't know that I've moved my, oh, oh, so, oh, I see what you mean, T-Money. Yeah, so, and I also, I did um, React videos several months ago, um, but that was using the old React docs. Um, that was using the, um, 
the the class based React docs, which have now been replaced by the ones we're going through here. So I will also be moving these modern React videos um, to YouTube as well uh, here pretty soon, probably within the next couple weeks. Yeah. No worries. But yeah, if you want to learn about class based React, which is the older way of writing React, um, which, you know, some companies, I'm sure they are, they still do that and they have the reasons for doing that. Um, so, you know, you may need to learn that older method for your employer. You know, lots of times employers have older tech stacks. <laughs> and so if you want to go through those, I went through the entire uh, old React docs uh, on this channel as well. Yeah, and like Parasocial says, that's the way half of the existing libraries are written, right? Because it would be probably impossible for most companies to upgrade their code bases, you know, entirely to move over to this newer version of writing React. They're just going to keep doing it the way they have been doing it. And so, you know, for your employer, that may be something you need to know. Hey, Fafin. Oh, you're playing with horses? Man, I want to be playing with horses. <laughs> I'm just going to turn on my captions here before I forget. Rascal used to remind me, but they've been busy lately because they got a job and stuff. So, like, you know. Why isn't it coming up? Ah, all right, here we go. Give me just a second. I'm connecting and... Let's see if their captions are going. It doesn't look like they're going yet. Oh, here we go. Okay. So captions should be available now if you want or need them. I'm having a good week, Faf, and I hope you are as well. Uh, Kalra asks, do you have intermediate slash advanced SQL VODs? I do not. Um, I have a couple of beginner SQL VODs. Um, so the reason Culver is asking is because my, for my day job, I'm a SQL developer. So <laughs> I do work with sort of intermediate and advanced SQL at work. Uh, however, I don't have any VODs like that on my channel. Um, the, primarily the purpose of this channel is for web development. I might do a more intermediate advanced SQL um, stream at some point. Um, I like to focus on web dev topics on this channel though, but you know, hey, that's not out of the question. Hey, ping pong. Uh, Latjoy says, how far are we going today? Um, I imagine we're, what we're going to do is, first off, we're going to do a review. Oops. First off, we're going to do a review of props because that was a big topic that we covered last week. And then we're also going to um, probably get through conditional rendering, rendering lists, and then keeping components pure. So essentially finishing up this first. So if we're, if we're looking at the documentation, we're in the describing the UI section and we Last week we did passing props, and then I'm expecting we'll probably get through these three today. Uh, and then that's probably what we'll, where we will end for the day. <laughs> Fafin says, friends and their Clydes. Oh, okay. So Fafin means Clydesdales, which is a type of horse, if you're not familiar. Uh, Clydesdales are a type of working horse. Uh, they are have very large bodies and very large feet. And so uh, Fafin says they got the chance to... Uh, uh, go see their Clydesdale horses. And uh, yeah, Clydesdales are very kind, beautiful horses, very gentle uh, and huge. And so they're, yeah. But if I had the chance to see some Clydesdales, I, I certainly wouldn't miss it. They yeah, have the Anheuser-Busch horses. Yeah, yep. Um, there are several different breeds of draft horse and uh, Clydesdales are uh, very large ones. <laughs> Feel Snabble there coming in with a React joke. Uh, why do other devs think React devs are nice to work with? The React devs always give props to them. Ha <laughs> ha. Nice one. <laughs> yeah, no worries, Kalra. I'm glad you want to expand your SQL knowledge. It's a great language to know. Um, yeah, and also, you know, useful in web development as well. Hey, Madeline, I hope you're having a good day. All right, so let's go ahead and get into it. Um, and like I mentioned, we're going to start out with a review of props uh, because props are what we spent all of the last stream on. Um, and so we're, gonna, we're not going to take that much time on it today, but I do think it's still worth um, 
reviewing. Um, and so, you know, if you want a deeper dive into props, I would highly suggest going back to last week's stream, which is available as a VOD here on my channel. Um, but I, you know, we should still review what we talked about last week because props are one of the most fundamental and important aspects of React. And they're really kind of what, they're, they're, they're half of what makes React tick. And the other half of what makes React tick is uh, what we're going to learn about later, which is called state. So props and state go hand in hand, but we've only talked about props so far. Um, let's see, Latjor asks, Mindwolf, have you tried the visual IDE for React called Codux? It is awesome for us beginners. Um, I have not. Uh, I've really only done React in sort of a, just writing it sort of in a vanilla sense. Um, I, I really want to, you know, get good at the concepts and then I'll probably start using helpers, but I'll look up Codex and see what that's like. All right. So um, talking about props, I'm going to skip this first section here. Um, as you recall, React is primarily made up of sort of self-contained units called components and components look very similar to functions. Um, so we write functions essentially, and we write them like functions as well, right? So here's a component that's called profile. And we just say export default function profile and profile is capitalized, right? Profile is capitalized because that's how we tell React that it is a component and not just a regular function. And so this is a component called profile. And inside of component, we are actually calling another component called avatar. Now here we're declaring the component called profile, right? And now we're here, we're calling avatar inside of profile. And when we call avatar, um, we write it in a similar way to an HTML tag, right? Um, except we can tell it's a component again, because we have a capital letter. Um, now, right now, the way we're calling avatar is it's essentially just, we're, we're calling it as is, right? We're, we're just, whatever's inside of that component is what's going to be returned. But a lot of the times you're going to actually want to, because React is bent, meant to be really responsive to user inputs and it's meant to allow the user interface to change based on other things that are happening elsewhere on the page, right? It's very... Well, it's reactive, right? It reacts to stuff. It reacts to user inputs. It reacts to, um, you know, conditions changing elsewhere. It's, it's meant to be reactive. And so if we want our components to react to stuff, we got to give them stuff to react to, right? We got we to gotta give them stuff. We got to tell them what's going on. They aren't going to know unless we tell them. And so what we, how we, how we tell these components what's going on or tell them what to do uh, is by giving them what we call props. So here's how we can give avatar some props. Um, so we're calling it, you know, we're still calling it with inside of its parent function profile, but we can also pass it some information. And so here we're passing it two props. One is person, which is an object. And the other one is size, which is a number. Now, if you recall, um, when we write in React, we're, we're writing in what we call JSX. Um, and when we pass things in, in as props in JSX, we generally wrap them in curly braces. Um, but why, does anybody remember, why do I have two sets of curly braces around person here? So I'm passing two props into avatar and that's going to tell avatar, we're going to pass them into avatar and avatar is going to be able to do stuff with those props. But why do I have one set of curly braces around size, but two sets around person? Does anybody remember? We talked about this a lot last week. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're passing an object. Exactly. Yeah. So um, we have the outer set of braces because that's what JSX requires, but then we have the inner set because we're passing an object as this prop called person. We're passing an object. And so, you know, by JavaScript rules, objects are wrapped in curly braces as well. So what that equates to then is two sets of curly braces. Good memory folks. <laughs> 
and Baffin says, yes, the, so we're talking about Clydesdales. They're the Budweiser horses. Um, we had a pair at our place. Oh, you found a home for them. That's awesome. They ate 1,800 pounds of hay in a month. It's so good to see them doing so. That's awesome. Great job, Baffin. Yeah, I love rescues and I love rescue horses. Uh, my parents are horse people. So that's awesome. But yeah, that's a lot of hay. Horses are expensive. Don't get a horse unless you can pay for it. Because <laughs> horses are expensive, especially big ones. But that's awesome, Baffin. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> So 5G says JSX should have used parentheses here, IMO. Oh, are you talking about just like, because that would make it easier to understand? Um, Cause yeah, these are the official React docs. So this is how, this is how you're supposed to write it. But yeah, so the, the, the double curly braces can be a little bit, um, you know, confusing, but once you understand the why, I think that helps a lot, right? We're talking about an object and then we're passing in, um, you know, it, and then it, by the rules of JSX, we need to pass, we need to use curly braces when we pass in these props. Um, so we, we're passing in two props here, person and size. And now that we've passed them into the component when we call it, right, the parent is passing those props in, then we can read the props inside of that child component called avatar. So how we set up the child to read those props is really similar to how we would set up a function to read certain things that we pass into it, right? And we do that by essentially when we declare a function, we set it up with some arguments, right? And so it's really similar, except we wrap those in curly braces. So it's not really a different or new concept, right? It, if we if we want to pass certain information into a function, we set it up with parameters, and then we can pass in information as arguments that fit those parameters, right? And here, we're really just replacing that concept with props. So that might be easier to think about it in that way. It's just be like, oh yeah, I already know that if I have a function and I want to pass information as arguments into that function, when I declare the function, I set it up with some parameters and that's how I do it. And same deal with React, except we pass those in as props. So it's really, you can think about it as conceptually sort of equivalent. It behaves in a little bit of a different way, but you can think about it as conceptually equivalent. Now, um, <laughs> St. Rufio says, this is starting to look normal to me. That's good. That's the goal, right? That's why we talk about this stuff. And then we go back over it again, right? And so it looks familiar the second time around. We don't just go right on to the new stuff. We're talking about what we talked about last week. So it looks familiar and it kind of jogs your brain and your brain says, oh yeah, this is something I should probably remember, right? Um, okay. So now you might say, all right, that's all well and good, but why did we wrap this in curly braces? So why does it, like, if it's just a function and we're just passing stuff into it as, you know, arguments, why, why is it wrapped in curly braces? Well, we'll get to that in just a second. Um, see if you remember why that is, you know, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to share it just yet, but you can see if you remember why we need curly braces here. Um, so now we're just going to look at a quick example to show why uh, or how we how we use those props that we can pass in. Um, <laughs> Beans, and Beans mate says new React docs are amazing. I agree. They're I feel like they're much better than the old ones, and they make things much clearer. So what are we doing here? Well, here we have a function called avatar, which takes in person and size. Um, okay, so I see how this. All right, so. The parent function here is profile. Let's make that bigger. The parent function here is profile and it calls avatar, the com avatar component. And into avatar, we pass in two props, one called size and then another one that's a person, which is an object that has a couple of different, um, oh, thank you for the follow there, Tristan. That has a couple of different properties inside of it, right? So size and person, we're passing that in. And then we have to make sure that avatar is set up to receive those props with the same name. So person and size, it's set up to receive both of those. 
And then now that we've passed them in, just like a function, just like the way we do with a function and its parameters, we can then reference those inside of our component, right? So here we're going into the person object and we're pulling out the name as the alt text. So if I hover over this, well, I guess alt text isn't working there, but um, the alt text for this image is now person.name. And then the other one where we can pass this person prop straight into this function. We can call the function and pass in person as an argument into that function. So I hope that makes sense. It's very similar to how we work with functions, right? Just regular plain old vanilla JavaScript functions. We um, we set them up to take in certain parameters and then we pass in information as arguments. <laughs> Why do you call mom to argue? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we call a function and we pass in arguments. Yep. They better be amazing. They were writing them for five years. Yeah. Tristan, thank you for the follow. Uh, and also Sultan, thank you for the follow. Appreciate it. So I hope that makes sense. But if you have any questions at any point, feel free to ask. Uh, I'm open to quote. I'm always open to questions at any point. Um, so props let you think about parent and child components independently. So we can change, you know, we can change the props in one and then just pass them down to the child. Um, and they're, yeah, they're sort of like knobs that you can adjust, right? So the, we can change the behavior of that child component based on the props that we pass into it, just like you could with a function. So generally we try to write uh, functions as basically um, performing the same action de uh, depending on whatever uh, arguments we pass into it, right? It should always return a predictable result based on what we pass into it. And so these components are the same, right? We want, we control their behavior by passing in certain props. Now, what's important to remember is that each time we pass props from a parent to a child, what we're actually doing is passing an object that's literally called props. So this is where we get a little bit different from uh, regular JavaScript functions. So instead of passing in, you know, separate arguments, we're actually, each time we pass something to, uh, to a, uh, a React component, we're actually passing an object called props. Now, we could do that every single time. And you might see this in the wild. You might see it's just, you know, passing a object called props from parent to child, just props, no distinguishing features or characteristics. And that props object contains all of the uh, information that we want to pass. So it can still contain multiple properties, you know, um, but it's just all bundled up into an object. However, that might be a little bit difficult to read and decipher. Um, and every time you want to reference something inside of that props object, you have to do props dot whatever. Here, we're, here they're doing props dot person, props dot size, blah, -de blah, -de blah. That's a little bit cumbersome, right? It's, you know, you don't necessarily always want to have to dig into that props object to pull out what you want and what you need. Um, so what you can do instead is wrap it in curly braces like we did here. Except, you know, right? Wrap it in curly braces like we did here. Now, does anybody remember what that's called? This is not a React specific thing. This, this, what we're doing here, where we, where we wrap an object in curly braces and pull out certain stuff from that object, is actually something that you can do in JavaScript with objects as well. What is it? Uh, does anybody remember what the term for this is called? When we take an object, wrap it in curly braces, and pull stuff out of it. JavaScript trivia. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's called destructuring. Yeah, right. All we're doing here is we're breaking apart that object by wrapping it in the curlies. We're breaking it apart and extracting these individual um, these individual key value pairs inside of the uh, inside of the object, and so then we can reference them individually without having to do props dot whatever every single time. Yep, it's destructuring. <laughs> yep, exactly. 
And Emma Jett, coming in there with the first time chat. Thank you for joining us. I love it when my first time chatters just like swoop in like with the right answer. You all just like, boom, you looking for this? Yeah, it's the best. Flatjaw says, just read that an hour ago on MDM. Yeah, destructuring is a great thing to know about. And again, it gives you a little bit of the why. Like, why are we using curly braces here? Well, because everything is passed from parent to child as a props object. And all we're doing here is taking that props object, destructuring it, and pulling out what we need, which is person and size. And so then instead of saying props dot whatever, we can just say person or size. And yeah, and, and down here they give us that answer, basically just saying, "Hey, don't miss the pair, don't miss the curlies," because that is how you tell React to destructure the props object and pull out the individual props inside of it. <laughs> uh, Colorado says, "I didn't dive too deep into JS past functions, and I didn't learn objects. Um, would you mind explaining the difference between functions and objects?" Yeah, so Latior says, you know, so basically functions do stuff. They're, you know, sort of logical capsules that you put something in and it, it does some logic and it returns something out of it. Um, whereas objects are storage, sort of. It, 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 you can bundle up a bunch of information into key value pairs and store that inside of a bundled, well, inside of a, inside of a bundled object, you give it a name, and then you can move that object around. Um, you can reference specific key value pairs inside of it, like we're doing here. Um, and so uh, I'm not familiar with Python, but I do know that yes, objects are similar to dictionaries in languages that do have dictionaries. So that may be a term that you're more familiar with. So another thing that you can do, oh, let's pause here for a second. So how are we feeling about props so far? Um, does anybody have any questions on props? Like what we're doing here, um, why we have to use curly braces, what props are, that kind of thing, before we get into some of the stuff you can do with props. I'm going to take a quick hydrate here. Sometimes I ask, I ask questions just so I'm, I have time to hydrate. Okay, good. <laughs> but yeah, feel free to ask questions at any time. So generally we're you know we're passing props into our components and we 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 pass in the the props from the parent to the child you know that the component needs in order to function right because you don't want an error so you want to give that component the props that it's expecting and the props that it needs in order to render whatever result it's going to render um however sometimes you might have instances where the parent is not always going to be able to supply the values that the, that the child component is expecting. Um, so you might have a sometimes type thing. There might be certain conditions that are met in order to create those props and they aren't always going to be met. So, you know, and we, we see this in functions as well, right? Sometimes you're not always going to get everything that that function needs in order to return a result, but you want to call that function anyway. And so what we can do with our components is just declare a default value. And so what this default value will do is if there is no prop given to it from the parent with that name. So here, if there is no size prop provided from the parent, but we do get a person prop, then size is just going to default to 100. However, if the parent is able to pass a size prop, even if that is like zero or null, then this default value will not fire and it will be overwritten by whatever gets passed in from the parent. So this default value will only trigger if there is no size being provided from the parent. It says, all right, well, I didn't get anything for this, so I'm just gonna assign a value of 100 and go ahead and render. So if avatar is rendered with no size prop, then the size will be set to 100. So the default value is only used if the size prop is missing or if you pass size undefined. But it's important to remember, as I mentioned, if you pass size null or size zero, 
Those are valid and the default value will not be used. Nakapa, <laughs> thank you for the follow. All right, now another thing that you can do instead is if you have a great many props that you want to pass. So, you know, we're passing one, two, three, four here. What you can do instead is take that larger props object and use the spread operator. So uh, what they've done here is just instead of, you know, passing all these individual props, uh, just take the spread operator and pass them in this way. So, oh, sorry, I highlighted the wrong thing. I apologize. So when we, sorry, when we call the component, instead of passing each prop in individually like this into that child component, uh, instead you can just use the spread operator, which is again, it's a default JavaScript thing. Um, you can take this and it will, it will spread those props apart uh, individually into their key value pairs. This forwards all of profiles props to the avatar without listing each of their names. Um, and, but it does say use spread syntax with restraint. If you're using it in every other component, something is wrong. <laughs> Often it indicates that you should split your components and pass children as JSX. So here's what that means. Uh, Makfa says, love studying a stream, especially on React. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, now we're still in the review section. So uh, if you want a deeper dive into props that we're talking about right now, we spent three hours on it last week. So we're just reviewing what we talked about last week here, um, but we'll be getting into new information soon. <laughs> Well, I'm honored that you think I look like Trinity. That's awesome. Trinity is, Trinity is amazing. Uh, so another thing we can do is instead of using the spread operator, what we can do is um, nest, our, uh, nest our components instead. So we often do this with HTML, right? We often take, like say, like a div tag, and then we put an image tag inside of it. And, you know, that's very common in HTML. And so what we can do with React components is something very similar. Um, what you might often see is maybe nesting components in terms of stylistic choices. So let's say you have a component that really just does, you know, sort of repetitive styling for you. Uh, in this example, they use like a card component. So this card component really is mostly for styling purposes. It, it provides rounded corners, it gives, its contents a nice solid line border. Um, it maybe uses a certain fill color, maybe a drop shadow. Um, all of these basically, we're just bundling a bunch of stylistic stuff together, and then we're shoving some contents inside of it. And so this makes a nice reusable stylistic component that we can put whatever we want inside of it, right? It could be an avatar, it could be some text, it could be a headline, um, just reusable. Um, when you, so this, and this gives us access to a new type of prop called children. So when you nest content inside of a JSX tag, the parent component will receive that content in a prop called children. For example, the card component below will receive a children prop set to avatar and render it in a wrapper div. So that's a very confusing sentence. So let's just look at the example and see what it's doing. So here we have our component called avatar um, stored in a separate file. So just be aware of that. We're importing our avatar component from this separate file, which you can look at yourself if you want to. Um, and what our card component is doing is it is getting the contents of itself. So it's getting its, its own contents in a prop called children. So what's happening here is profile component is rendering the card, which is like the border that's right. It's, it's this outside part. And then the contents are set to the avatar component and avatar is getting a, you know, picture information. It's getting picture size. And then how does card know what should be inside of it? Well, avatar is 
essentially building itself. And then that information about what should be inside the card is passed to the card component via this child prop or this children prop. So then what card returns is a div with the class name of card and then everything that goes inside of it, which includes this avatar component. So that's a bit of a, it's a bit of a brain buster, right? Um, is thinking about, wait, okay, wait, how does this, you know, how does, how does card know what should go inside of it? Well, card only knows what should go inside of it by the props that we pass into it. And that's kind of the fundamental reason that props exist, right? Because functions are self-contained. Our components are self-contained and they don't know what's happening anywhere else outside of themselves other than the props that we pass into them. So the only way they can tell what's going on outside is by the props that we give them. So in this case, since card needs to contain avatar and everything going on with avatar, we need to pass that information into the card component via this children prop. So card knows exactly what to render. So it's a bit, it's, it takes a little bit to get your head around, but just remember that even though we're nesting components here, card has no clue what's inside of it unless we tell it explicitly what's inside of it via this children prop. Okay. So if you see this children prop being used, that's not a custom declaration anywhere. That is a default type of prop that we use when we are nesting components. <laughs> Thank you for the follow DHEX. Dodge this knowledge. Yeah. Yeah, can't. <laughs> Shoot and react into my brains, right? All right, so you can think of a component with a children prop as having a hole that can be filled in by its parent components with arbitrary JSX. So you'll often use the children prop for visual wrappers, such as panels, grids, cards, those kind of stylistic wrappers. All right, so the last sort of major um, concept here when we talk about props is learning how props change over time. So the clock component below receives two props from its parent component, which are color and time. And we can see that, right? So our clock component here receives two things, color and time. And if I were to pick a different color, then we can see that the behavior of my component changes based on the color that I pick, right? We've got light coral, midnight blue, Rebecca purple, and the clock keeps ticking without my direct intervention. So, and it says here, the parent components code is omitted because it uses state, which is, again, is the other half of props. And we have not talked about that yet. So we're not going to dwell, dwell on that at the moment. Um, but we can see that the color and time props are controlling the behavior of this component. So a component may receive different props over time and props are not always static. Here, the time prop changes every second and the color prop changes when you select another color. Props reflect a component's data at any point in time rather than only in the beginning. And it's kind of similar with functions, right? We can, we can keep sending a function. We can keep calling a function over and over again and sending it different arguments. And that function should uh, process those new arguments every time we call it with those new arguments, right? It's not going to retain necessarily. It's not going to retain the, what we passed it before. It's going to say, oh, okay, I'm being called again. I have some new arguments. I need to do something with those. And um, and process those arguments and return what I'm supposed to return. And so that's all they're really saying here. But something to note is that props are immutable, which is a wonderful vocab word. I love this word. It's right up there with concatenate uh, as one of my favorite words. Uh, just a very fun one to know. And one that you could maybe, you know, bring out in an interview and make yourself, you know, sound really good to the, to the hiring manager. Um, so immutable means unchangeable, essentially. 
Um, when a component needs to change its props, so let's say that maybe my component is a form. This is, a, this is an example you probably see a lot. If my component, say, is a form, and the user interacts with that form in any way, maybe types in the box, clicks a button, changes a setting, and that form needs to update itself, then what it needs to do is ask its parent component, hey, parent component, um, give me new props. I need to have a different look. I need to look different than I did before. But as we know, a component is entirely reliant on the props that it's given in order to change its behavior. So what it needs to do is say, hey, parent component, um, somebody's done something. Um, I think I need some new props now, please. And then the parent component passes down the new props that that child needs in order to change its appearance, change its behavior, produce a different result. So its old props will then be cast aside and eventually the JavaScript engine will, rec will reclaim the memory. So it abandons its old props and updates itself based on the new props that are given to it by its parent component. So that's a really important concept is that we don't try to change props. When you need to respond to user input, like changing the selected color, you will need to set state, which we will learn about later. So you cannot change a prop that's already been received. You simply need to ask the parent component for new props. Thank you for the follow, Salzig. Sol <laughs> I hope I said that correctly. Thank you for the follow. Yeah, and parasocial notes too, that when we're talking about props, you could also pass uh, JSX as props or render props. So what they're showing there is that, you know, you could have um, a, uh, you could call a child component and then also just pass in a div to that child component as well. All right, so this, you know, this whole immutable thing might not make perfect sense just yet, but the important thing to remember is that props are immutable. You can't change them once they're received. So that child component cannot change the props it's received. If it wants new props, it needs to ask its mom or parent or guardian, whatever. It needs to ask its, its parent or guardian, hey, could I have some new props, please? I want to do something different. Um, so it's almost like when you're, you know, when you're like a kid or something like that and you, you know, maybe you want a new t-shirt with your favorite cartoon character on it or something like that. When you're a kid, you don't really have the means to just go out and, you know, go to the store, drive to the store and buy a new t-shirt. You need to ask your parent to buy that new t-shirt for you and then give it to you. So the components are almost like children. They don't really have autonomy. They need to ask their parent to give them the means to change their behavior or change their appearance or change their action. Okay, so hopefully that maybe helps you remember that a little bit better when we're thinking about parent-child relationships is it's pretty literal. Um, the child cannot change its behavior without direct assistance from the parent. Okay. So basically to pass props, we add them to the JSX, just like you would with HTML. To read props, we use our destructuring syntax where we destructure the props object into its individual parts, and then we can reference those parts directly inside of our component. Now, you can also specify a default value for a particular prop, uh, which will cover any missing or undefined props. So you don't have to do this. If you know a prop is always gonna be passed correctly from the parent, then there's no need to specify a default. However, if you know that maybe that's not always going to be the case, you can just put it in a default value so that you don't get unexpected behavior or errors um, when you're trying to uh, call your components. You can forward props with a spread syntax uh, if you want to. Um, and you can also nest components like this, where we have an outer component called card with a child component called avatar nested inside of it. And how card then knows what its contents need to be, how it will know that is everything inside of avatar will be passed to card as a children prop, a prop specifically called children. 
And so that way card will know exactly what to render. Um, and then like we just talked about, props are read only snapshots in time. Every render, every time that component re-renders, it receives a new version of props. So you can't change props. When you need interactivity, you will need to set state. And again, that's the other half of this, and that's how we really make our components interactive. And so we'll be talking about that in the next section. So probably in the very next um, stream after this one. Um, so we won't be talking about it today, but probably in the very next stream, we're going to start getting into how props and state interact and allow us to give our user interfaces real, true interactivity and how these components can talk to each other in a logical and structured way. All right, we did the challenges last time, but if you want more review of props and how they work and how they behave, um, I would highly suggest revisiting these challenges. Um, and if you want to walk through them with me, uh, you can go to last week's stream and we spent uh, quite a lot of time, you know, working through each of these challenges and really, really understanding them. So um, any last questions on props before we go into the new content for this week, which is talking about conditional rendering and rendering lists. I'm going to hydrate again here. I always let my tea get cold way too fast. All right. I'm not seeing any questions so far, but again, feel free to ask. Or if I'm saying something in a weird way and you, you maybe you don't, maybe you can't articulate a question, but you're just not quite understanding how I'm saying something. Uh, feel free to ask that as well. Thank you for the follow totally rat. <laughs> That's a great username. I used, to, I used to have pet rats. I've had several pet, pet rats over the years. They're great little animals. All right, so let's go ahead and get into conditional rendering. Now, the next two topics that we're going to cover, which are conditional rendering and rendering lists, might actually feel a little bit familiar to you. I know that props were kind of like woo-woo out there, sort of a brand new concept. But I think you'll probably recognize conditional rendering and rendering lists um, as things that are familiar to you, especially if you've worked with something like EJS, um, which allows you to kind of basically conditionally render HTML um, based on you know, certain logical conditions or things that are passed into it from JavaScript. Uh, Lightjar says, this one sound, sounds exciting. That's awesome, yeah. Um, and if you've worked with something like EJS before, um, you know, which is kind of, it allows you to do some, like I said, logical rendering of HTML, um, then some of these concepts might feel a little bit familiar. So, and also I think this is a good, this is a good review of overall like JavaScript logic too. Um, so things like, you know, how we write conditional statements and how we can do shorthand for various conditional statements. So rather than doing if else, some of the shorthand options that we can use instead. So your components will often need to display different things depending on different conditions. In React, you can conditionally render JSX using JavaScript syntax like if statements, double ampersands, and ternary operators. So the question mark and the colon, ternary statements, right? So here we're going to learn how to return different JSX depending on a condition, how to conditionally include or exclude a piece of JSX, and common uh, conditional syntax shortcuts you'll encounter in React code bases. Uh, Lotjar says EJS is express. No, so um, EJS is essentially like a templating language that you can use on the HTML side um, to. Uh, perform sort of simple logical operations to conditionally render pieces of HTML. Yeah. But it's okay if it's okay if you haven't used EJS. I'm just saying that, that might make it, you know, it might feel a little familiar if you have, but if you haven't, you'll you'll I'm sure you'll be able to to get this as well. So, let's say that you have a packing list component rendering several items, which can be marked as packed or not. I'll show, make this a little bigger. So here we have our packing list component. 
And what this renders is a section div with an H1 and then a list. And inside of that list, the list contains several item components. And into each item component, we're passing different props, right? So we're calling the same component multiple times. We're calling our item component multiple times, but we're passing in different props each time, which causes different behavior. So what's in the item component? Well, in the item component, we're taking in our name and is packed props, which are passed down from the parent. And we are rendering an individual li tag with a class name of item and this name value here. Now you notice that the is packed prop isn't being used yet. We're going to use it in a second. We're going to add some logic to indicate whether or not an item is packed. But right now it's not being used. We're just, all we're doing is we're returning an li with the name of the item as the text in that li. Okay. So some of the item components have their is packed prop set to true instead of false. So we want to add a check mark to packed items if is packed equals true. So to do that, we can write an if else statement like so. We can just add some logic that says, hey, if is packed, then return the li with a check mark. And if it's not, then return the same li with no check mark. And it says if the is packed prop is true, the code returns a different JSX tree. With this change, some of the items get a check mark at the end. Now, quick little um, JavaScript review here. Notice that there is no um, comparison here, right? We're not saying if is packed equals true. We're just saying if is packed. So why does that work? What are we implying here if we just say if is packed? Yeah, exactly. So if we just say if is packed, this is, this becomes then a truthy value. So if is packed was false, this would be implied false. And if it's true, it's implied true. And so it will follow the true path, right? It's in, as Drunk Uncle Grandma said, it's an implicit return. We're implying here that if we just say if is packed with no comparison, then if is packed is true, we'll follow the true path, it's truthy, and if not, it's falsy. Yeah, Yarmulenko, it's a Boolean, exactly, yeah. Yep, so if we pass in a Boolean value and we just say if and then the name of the Boolean, then if it's true, we follow the true path, false, we follow the false path. So now let's see how we incorporate that logic into our component. So here, now we're just declaring the item component again, passing in the same two props, and we do our little check, and that helps us determine which li we're going to return. Everything else remains the same, right? Here, we just now just have some logic determining which should be returned, and now we can see that logic reflected in our output. Hey, Hassler. Um, so Hassler, you only really missed the review. We did a review of props uh, and we just got into the new content. Now we're starting to talk about conditional rendering or using uh, you know, if else logic uh, in order to determine how components are rendered. So, and you can edit this logic if you would like. Uh, if you're new to these, docu to these docs, it's actually pretty nice. You can, you know, these are all editable. So we could, you know, change this to be a, like a, uh, what, was, what do we want to say here, like Y. So if I do that, you know, you can see that the output changes. And so you can mess with this output in real time. And if you're not sure about how something is going to behave, or if you want to test maybe like an edge case and see what's going to happen, 
then you can just edit. This is just a sandbox and you can edit this in real time. And we'll see that in a little bit when we get into the challenges. Um, so you never have to leave your browser. And so I think that's a very nice way to learn. You don't have to juggle multiple tools. You can just play with this in your browser. So we're creating some branching logic with our if and return statements. So control flow is handled by JavaScript. And so if you're already familiar with how to do this sort of thing uh, in JavaScript, you'll probably find this familiar. Now, there may be the case where you don't necessarily want to render anything at all. For example, say you don't want to show packed items at all. A component, now this is important, a component must return something. So you have to, to, to make your component complete, you have to have a return statement and return something. However, if you don't want to return anything visually, you can have it return null. So if you want to make packed items disappear, you can simply pack in, you can, you can simply pass in that is packed prop. And if it's true, you return null. If it's false, you can return your li just like the way you did before. And so we can see the result of that here. Whereas anything that has a value of true for is packed, we just return null. It doesn't show anything in the visual output. However, we all are still returning something. We are returning null. Hey, Dicey, welcome to the stream. Uh, I do not have any videos about Redux. Um, however, if anybody has any recommendations about someone that does have good Redux videos, feel free to share them in the chat. Uh, Rascal2 might have done something with Redux. I'm not 100% sure. I just assume that Rascal's done everything at some point. So, you know, <laughs> they're a good place to check. Um, and they're, uh, I'll, I'll just go ahead and shout them out. Rascal. There we go. I just like to take any excuse to shout out Rascal. <laughs> hey, Justice. Welcome to the stream. Uh, Justice, today we are covering React and we're talking about conditional component rendering. So if that's up your alley, feel free to stick around. So in practice, returning null from a component isn't common because it might surprise a developer trying to render it. More often, you would continue, you would conditionally exclude, include or exclude the component inside the parent components JSX. So yeah, you might not often see returning of nulls. Uh, I don't know that I have seen it in the wild, but a smarter way to do it is probably just to conditionally include or exclude the component in the return from the parent. So in the previous example, you controlled which, if any, JSX tree would be returned by the component. You might have already noticed some duplication in the render output, right? So before, what we said was, if it's true, return the li with the class name, the name, and then a check mark. And then for the false, we return exactly the same thing, except without the check mark, right? So that feels a little repetitive, right? Like why? I don't know. It, it, it's a little bloated, a little repetitive. Um, maybe we don't do that. And we can see it more visually here, right? Just it's the same thing repeated, just one small different. So the, there's nothing wrong with this, right? But you know, we are we're leak we're leak coders, right? We don't want to we don't want to repeat ourselves. We're we're code war one liners. We don't want to repeat ourselves. And so the more we duplicate stuff, the more we um, the more we repeat ourselves. Uh, the harder it makes that code to maintain. Because if I ever wanted to update this li to look different, I would now have to update it in multiple places. And knowing me, I would forget to do that. So what if we want to change something like the class name? You'd have to do it in two places in your code. In such a situation, you could conditionally include a little JSX to make your code more dry, right? Don't And dry, if you didn't know, dry stands for don't repeat yourself. Uh, and you can check out this link if you want to learn more about dry. So what we could do instead as an alternative to repeating ourselves 
is use the ternary operator. Now you're probably already familiar with ternary operators. Uh, if you're if you are familiar with you know newer JavaScript, I think since like ES 2015, um, you should be familiar with ternaries. So JavaScript has a complex has it sorry has a compact syntax for writing a conditional expression, and this is called the conditional operator or ternary operator. Instead of this, which is a separate, you know, if and then an else here, you can simply write this. A return statement becomes the outer list item, which doesn't change, right? The, out, the behavior of the outer list item doesn't change based on our condition. So we can leave that alone. We can leave it out of the statement. And then since we're working inside of an li tag, we put our curly braces around and we simply use a ternary to say, all right, is, is packed true? Question mark. If it is, then name plus check mark. Else, which is signified by the colon, just name. And so that handles that condition in a single line without us having to repeat ourselves and rewrite the list item. So justice, yes. So I special, I, I agree with you. I don't like nesting ternaries and I don't, it's not something that I do, but for very simple conditions like this, I think this is a perfect use case for a ternary um, because you have a very small list item and um, you are simply, you're, you're, you're doing really only one small operation here. You're controlling whether or not a checkbox appears. Um, and so I think this is honestly a perfect use case for a ternary. Now, there's some cases where a ternary is not ideal. When you're dealing with a large volume of information, um, when there's big differences between your if else, um, when you are, like you say, when you're nesting ternaries, yeah, that sucks. I, I don't do that. Whenever uh, um, I have like nested conditions, I generally switch over to the more classic if else, or, or I know not everybody likes this, but I will use a case statement instead if, it, if there's a, a large number of conditions. I like case statements. Most people don't. But yeah. So you can read this some, similar to if is packed is true, then render name plus check mark. Otherwise, render name. <laughs> uh, I feel like I'm the only one that likes, that likes uh, switch cases. I do have a spot, soft spot for him. I know exactly. Well, that's what La <laughs> that's why Latjor. It's because I like SQL, and those types of statements are very common in SQL, and so they're very familiar to me and easy to understand. And so I came over to JavaScript, and I was like, "Oh yeah, you guys have, uh, you know, you guys have what we call them, you know, uh, uh, like, uh, <laughs> yeah." We have these, you know, we just like, oh, you guys have case statements too. And everybody was like, boo. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> 21 says, for the life of me, I can never remember switch case. And I have to bring up MDN. And that's fine too, you know. Um, but they can be useful when you have a large number of conditions. It's all about the right tool for the job, right? And, you know, I, I would not use a ternary for multiple nested if else conditions, or if, if, if my statement has a lot of possible return values, I would also never use a ternary for that. But for little things like this, I think it's a perfect use case for a ternary. It makes it compact, very easy to read. Um, and so I'm always hesitant to say, you know, it's always about, I, I'm always hesitant to have a bias toward one type of conditional or another. And in general too, when you're writing code, it's important to not have too many biases because it's all just about the right tool for the right job and the right conditions. <laughs> Switches are very easy to read, but a pain to write. Exactly. It's about, you know, front end load versus uh, ease of reading later on. So real quick, let's look and see. All right. So our two examples that we provided, are they fully equivalent? If you're coming from an object oriented programming background, you might assume that the two examples above are subtly different because one of them may create two different instances of li. So the first example with the if, you know, you might think, well, it's going to create one li, and then the other one, the other could create a possible different instance of li. But JSX elements aren't instances because they don't hold any internal state and aren't real DOM nodes. And that's really important to remember is that we aren't, 
when we look at stuff like this here, this is not HTML. This is JSX that's wearing a mask to make itself look like HTML. It's disguised as an HTML tag. This is just this is just JSX all the way down, baby. Um, this is, and then it renders out in the end. Once this logic is complete, then it renders out in the DOM as HTML. But when we're writing it, when we're when we're dealing with logical stuff like this, it is not HTML. It is JSX. So these are just lightweight descriptions of what it's going to eventually become like blueprints. I really like this. It, it, it's a really nice way to remember that what we're working with when we're writing JSX is not, you know, a job, JavaScript and then HTML tags. It's JSX across the board. It's just, we're just describing how we want it to look eventually. It's a blueprint. We're writing these blueprints. And then when we execute our code, it's going to follow those blueprints and render what we've told it to. Drunk Oko Grandma says, exactly why I love the EJS to JSX transition. Yeah, it's a similar um, concept to EJS in that we are, we're writing something that's masked to look like HTML, but really under the hood, it's absolutely not. In the end, what it spits out is HTML, but the logical operations are performed against, here they're performed against, you know, JavaScript, JSX logic. <laughs> hey, Holy Lab, console log, hello. Console log, hello to you too. <laughs> All right, so let's say that you want to wrap the completed items text into another HTML tag, um, like Dell to strike it out. Actually, wait, I think it's time for a break. So let's pause here for a second. Um, and we like to take a break at the top of each hour because it's important to be healthy, right? Um, it's important to get up. It's important to drink water. It's important to use the restroom and stretch and, you know, interact with other people in your household. And so let's go ahead and take a break. Uh, and when we come back, we'll get back into conditional rendering. We'll talk about some logical operators. Um, We'll talk about conditionally assigning JSX, and then we will do some challenges, which since I know a lot of you all are already familiar with JavaScript logic, um, I expect that y'all will be able to just slam dunk these challenges and just, you know, ace it. So I'm looking forward to that when we come back after the break. <laughs> um, Hassler says, meaning JSX is the combination of JavaScript and HTML, if I got you, well, what it allows us to do, so to be clear, what it allows us to do is to write familiar JavaScript logic and then include markdown tags inside of that logic. So it's basically like we're just we're, we're doing logic and we're writing blueprints that's going to tell our JSX how to build the HTML in the browser. So we're still going to be giving you our we're still going to be giving the browser HTML in the end, but we are writing some blueprints and then giving that back to our JSX to interpret those and spit out HTML in the end. So this isn't real HTML here. We we aren't writing an li tag like you would if you were in an HTML file. We're writing a blueprint that will eventually render as an HTML tag with some stuff in it. So it's markdown. Yeah. And, and uh, if you want to read more about that, if you want to read more about that, um, you can look at, um, I think, let's see. Yeah, I think you want to look at this section right here, writing markup with JSX, um, which we covered in part one. I think that was in the first stream. So if you want to, if you want to dive more into the difference between um, writing HTML and then writing JSX with markup, then uh, I would suggest checking out this section here and going back to the first stream and, and listening along with that. Thank you for the follow, Tiknu. And uh, Basupalab91, thank you. Okay, let's take our break. And when we come back, 
y'all are gonna blow me away with how well you understand conditional logic and acing some challenges after we cover a few more small uh, logical operations that you can do. All right, I'll see y'all back here in five. And I'm watching you. Y'all better get up and stretch if you're able to do so. Don't just sit there the whole time. That's not valid. You're not allowed to do that. Okay? Okay. All right, folks, we've got about a minute left in the break, so come on back when you're ready. Thank you for the follow, Ima Jet. I appreciate it. Lots of new followers today. Thank you. Go ahead and get up and stretch if you haven't already. Get yourself a drink. Pet your dog, pet your cat. Pet your significant other, with their permission, of course and then come on back. <clears throat> All righty, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the timer and get my camera back on here. 
right, we are back. Welcome back, folks. So let's keep talking about conditional rendering. So before the break, uh, we saw that one way you can do some conditional rendering is by using a ternary operator. Um, and so we can reduce repetition by wrapping that ternary in our list tag and then only having the ternary control what should, the, the, the optional part, right? The thing that we want to be optional. We, we only wrap that part in our ternary. Now, I do have a quick question for you. So this is something I wanted to ask earlier and I forgot. So I have a pop quiz. All right. So why, does anybody remember why we wrap this statement in curly braces? Why do we wrap this statement in curly braces? Does anybody remember? Anyone recall? If you don't remember, that's okay. You're allowed to not remember. You can just say, I don't know. But I am curious if anybody remembers why we have to use curly braces. Whereas, for example, in, uh, let me see if I can find an example. Whereas, like, we don't have to wrap our if statement here. We don't have to wrap our if in curly braces. So why do we use, why do we use curly braces down here for this part? Yeah, exactly. Y'all do remember. Good job. <laughs> Justice says, well, we're inserting a JavaScript expression into JSX. Uh, almost, yes, almost. Good thought. Um, and Ticknew says, well, this is how you inject JS code in HTML on React. Yeah, so essentially what we're doing is we are starting to write a tag here, right? We're starting to write a tag. And all of a sudden, we want to get out of that tag switch back to JavaScript logic, do something in JavaScript logic, and then go back to writing our markup tag. So it's really like, uh, and um, uh, Sam Rufio used the correct term there, which is escaping. So we are escaping our tag here to use JSX for a bit and then go back to our tag. And so I think the analogy that I used last time when we talked about this, or maybe two times ago, I don't remember, is that it's like we, we're switching modes here, right? We're, we're starting to write a tag, and then all of a sudden, you want to peek into JavaScript for just a minute, peek through that window, and then go back to writing your tag, right? So that's just important to remember, is that once you start writing a tag, if you want to do some JavaScript or you know JSX logic, you need to wrap it in curlies, escape your tag, and then go back to the tag when you're ready. Yep. Yeah, exactly. The, the the curlies are like a window into JS land. Yep. And if you want more practice with that, you can go back to this section here, JavaScript in JSX with curly braces. Okay. So if you want more practice on when you should use curlies and when you shouldn't, um, check out this section here, which we covered. I think that was also in stream one. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Good answers, everybody. So let's say that you want to wrap the completed items text into another HTML tag like del to strike it out. You can add even more new lines and parentheses so that it's easier to nest more JSX in each of the cases. Uh, and so what we're doing here is what we want is as soon as we finish an item, so we still add the checkbox to things that are completed, but we also want to wrap the entire thing in a tag that's going to strike it out. So we can do that by further modifying our item component to still return the li. Now here they're, you know, they're making it the, and then still use a ternary operator, but basically just adding a little bit more meat to it. And now here, uh, you know, it, it's getting a little bit more complex. You're sort of hitting the edge of maybe the usefulness of a ternary. It just depends on your, your um, stomach for this sort of thing. But again, it's still the same ternary operator, right? We're checking is packed. 
Well, first off, we're wrapping it in curly braces because we have to. Then we're checking to see if is packed is true or false. And we're writing our del time. Again, using curly braces to concatenate the name and the check mark. And then going into the else condition and just writing name. So it's really the same behavior. We're just adding one extra tag to it. Okay. Um, Justice says it's similar to why we need script tags in HTML to execute JS. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I suppose, maybe conceptually. Um, Pancho Poto, thank you for the follow. <laughs> yeah, and with JavaScript, you're, you're, you're right, Justice. Yeah, with JavaScript, everything's objects, right? <laughs> I'm just, I was more talking about how, um, you know, as, as they get, as ternaries get longer and longer, they get harder to follow. And so if you're just reading, I mean, there's no operationally, there's no problem with it, but as ternaries get longer, it can get harder to tell where you're at in the ternary. So, um, it just depends on how you like to look at things, but yeah, so essentially we're doing the same thing. We're just wrapping our, um, condition here in an additional Dell tag, which adds our strikeout and then keeping the same for the uh, else condition. But again, we're using curly braces in both cases because we are inside of tags. And so in order to escape those tags and do other stuff, we have to use curlies. All right, this style works well for simple conditions, but use it in moderation. And here they're saying exactly what we were talking about. If your components get messy with too much nested conditional markup, consider extracting child components to clean things up. Yeah. And that's you if you if you're starting getting too deep into nested conditions, well then you ought to just branch off those uh, child conditions into child components and call them that way. In React, markup is a part of your code. So you can use tools like variables and functions to tidy up complex expressions. Serious Scaper, thank you for the follow. <laughs> oh, sorry for the sub. For the sub, did you sub Serious Scaper? Thank you. I didn't get a notification. I apologize, but thank you for the sub, Serious Scaper. Much appreciated. Yeah, I don't know why that notification didn't pop. I think when I like when people resub, it's not working properly. So I apologize for that. All right. Next, let's talk about logical and operators. So again, this is another thing that JavaScript already does. We're just gonna learn how to use it with React. So another common shortcut you'll encounter is the JavaScript logical and or double ampersand uh, operator. Thank you for the follow, Simachato. <laughs> Inside React components, uh, it often comes up when you want to render some JSX when the condition is true or render nothing otherwise. With double ampersands, you could, you could conditionally render the check mark only if is packed is true. And this is, I, I find the logic, the double ampersand particularly useful. Um, you know, if you just want something to show up only if the true condition is met, um, you can use the double ampersands and that makes it much cleaner than just, you know, not needing an else condition at all. So this makes our little um, list item that we've been working with, this makes this even cleaner than it was before, right? Now we can just say, all right, li class name item, render the name, and then if is packed is truthy, right? Because we aren't doing a, we aren't doing a comparison here, it's implied. We are saying, hey, if is packed is truthy, then render the check mark. If it isn't, then nothing. Don't do anything. <laughs> hey, Sir Machado, welcome to the stream. Oh, hey, no worries, Sirius. It's good to see you again. Sorry about the ads. Um, yeah, if anybody does get an ad, I apologize in advance because I, I have ads turned as low as I can, but Twitch does not allow you to turn them off, unfortunately. I don't care about ad revenue. I would turn them off if I could, uh, but Twitch does not let me do that. So, unfortunately. 
because yeah, it doesn't. It, it it basically the only thing the ads do is generate money for Twitch, and it doesn't. I don't really get anything out of it, and I wouldn't care if I did. So, um, the moment Twitch allows you to turn off ads completely, I will so be there. All right, so we can read this statement as if is packed, then render the check mark. Otherwise, render nothing. Oh, you, you used a prime sub, Sirius. That's awesome. Yes, use those prime subs. Um, prime subs are the best because they don't cost you, the viewer, they don't cost you anything at all. They are, if you sub to Amazon Prime, do not pay for a Twitch sub. You have one that is already exists on your account. You can use one a month on your favorite streamer. It doesn't have to be me. Um, use it on somebody because it doesn't cost you a thing and it gets rid of ads and it gives them a little income. So Prime subs are great and be sure to use yours. Oh, Ray Anthony, thank you for the sub. Why aren't my notifications working? I apologize. Oh, thank you so much, Ray Anthony. If you have Amazon Prime, just a Prime sub? Wow, okay. I mean, Prime does have some good benefits. So make sure you're getting your money's worth. JS is <laughs> Justin says JS is kind of weird. Yeah, JS is very weird. JS is uh, almost exclusively weird, right? Extremely so. <laughs> if if you had to, if you had to use one word to define JavaScript, it would be weird. All right, so a JavaScript double ampersand expression returns the value of its right side, um, in our case, the check mark, if the left side or our condition is true. And so the double ampersand basically just checks to see, hey, if true condition is met, return whatever's to the right of the double ampersands. Um, if the condition is false, the whole expression becomes false. React considers false as a whole in the JSX tree, just like null or undefined, it doesn't render anything in its place. All right. <laughs> Same review says, wow, I've had the double ampersand short circuit evaluation memorized for a year. And this is the first time I'm seeing it used functionally. <laughs> I've seen it used several times. I've actually used it myself more than once. Um, and because occasionally you just have a condition where you're just like, look, I only want this to do something if the thing I'm passing in is true. And I just don't want, I don't want to worry about any false conditions. I just will only want it to do something if this is true. And that uh, double ampersand is really, really useful. <laughs> it's exciting. Yeah. Um, now here's a pitfall, just something to be aware of. So don't put numbers on the left side of double ampersand. So to test the condition, JavaScript converts the left side to a Boolean automatically. However, if the left side is zero, then the whole expression gets that zero and React will happily render zero rather than nothing. For, a com for example, a common mistake is to write code like message count, double ampersand, and then render a paragraph. It's easy to assume that, that it renders nothing when message count is zero, but really it renders the zero itself. So to fix it, make the left side a Boolean expression. So here we're gonna say, all right, if message count is greater than zero, if that condition evaluates to true, so we've converted it to a Boolean to check if this condition is true, then it will render properly. So that's an interesting little tidbit there is that if you, if you make this into something other than a Boolean, then it's just going to, if it does render, it's just going to render a zero. So that's kind of cool. I didn't know that. Um, it's something to remember, and it's probably a mistake you'll only make once. <laughs> Fuel Snobble says that the double ampersand is nice when you need to check if something is not null and then call something on it. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so any questions there? So we talked about ternaries, and then we talked about Essentially, if you don't want a, a false condition at all, you can use a double ampersand um, and React will treat it as um, essentially something that just won't render at all. <laughs> all right. 
So now let's talk about conditionally assigning JSX to a variable. When the shortcuts get in the way of writing plain code, so this is, this is important to remember too. So when the shortcuts get in the way of writing plain code, try using an if statement and a variable, right? It, it's it's kind of like the code wars um, trap, right? It, it's the code wars pitfall is that you can get to the point where you're trying to use all these fancy shortcuts and everything and you get in the way of yourself uh, making code that's understandable and readable. So when everything else fails, go back to the beginning and just write an if statement. <laughs> go back to basics and write an if statement and a variable. So here we're gonna kind of go back to basics here and we're gonna declare a variable called item content. And item content is gonna contain the value of our name prop. Use an if statement to reassign a JSX expression to item content if is packed is true. So here we're saying, all right, if is packed is true, then item content is equal to our name value plus the check mark. And then as a reminder, curly braces open the window into JavaScript. And so inside of our tag, we can simply embed our variable inside of our list item tags and just pass it out that way. So what we're doing here is essentially getting all of the logic out of the way first, right? We're doing all of our logic first and then simply returning the result. So this maybe looks a little bit more similar to um, like a, a basic JavaScript function, right? In a JavaScript function, you're gonna have, you know, you're more likely to maybe have your logic out of the way first and then have your return statement be something fairly simple. So here, what we're doing is we're just saying, all right, we're gonna declare our variable, we're gonna do our logic, and then in the end, we're only gonna return the results of that logic, okay? Thank you for the follow, Elku99. <laughs> I love that everybody's sharing weird JavaScript facts in chat. <laughs> I'm only kind of skimming over it, but it's pretty funny. JavaScript is so weird. It's important to remind ourselves of this weirdness, right? Which is why like this is like fairly basic, you know, talking about ternaries, talking about ampersands, um, all these things. It might seem like simple you know, rudimentary JavaScript stuff, but Java, JavaScript is so freaking weird that it's good to remind ourselves of this and learn how to apply it in practice versus just understanding it conceptually. So again, this code here gives us the same results as all of our previous fancy one-liner type stuff, our ternary operators, you know, our ampersand stuff, um, except we're we're, we're writing things in a more verbose way and we're getting the logic out of the way first and then only returning the results. <laughs> Welcome to the stream, Elku. <laughs> oh man, JavaScript being nice and like choosing its own inter interpretation of things is like the... I don't know. I think it's the main cause of JavaScript's weirdness. All right. And so like before, this works not only for text, but also for arbitrary JSX. And so this is just another alternate way of writing that same statement. So we're declaring a variable and then we're checking to see if is packed is true. And if it is true, then we are putting we're essentially, so if is packed is true, we're changing the assignment of item content and adding the del tags and the extra check mark and everything like that. So if is packed is true, we're giving it all this extra styling and extra content. If it's false, then the content of item content variable does not change. And so in the end, we just return the contents of the item content variable, right? So these two examples both accomplish the same thing, just in different ways. I would argue that the first example where we do all the logic first, set up the item content and then return that, I would, I would argue that's, you know, 
I would I, I would argue that that's more readable, but if we want to add additional styling, that's what they've done down here. You know, we're adding additional styling, we're making it a little bit more complex, um, but in the end it accomplishes, you know, the same thing with a little extra styling. And I would say that doing it this way, getting all the logic out of the way first, is probably better than trying to do all that inside of a ternary. That would just be my opinion, personal opinion, um, is doing it inside of this if statement instead of a ternary looks better, reads better, and then in the end, we just return the content. So, but again, personal choice. Um, if you want to nest your ternaries, you know, down into oblivion, um, you know, or, or, or make them huge, I'm, you know, hey, I'm not going to stop you. Thank you for the follow, DHL and Lospark. Man, so many new follows today. <laughs> so, and you know, as just, as a reminder, if you're not familiar with JavaScript, this variety of styles might seem overwhelming at first. However, learning them will help you read and write any JavaScript code and not just React components. Yes, like kind of like we've been saying all along, this is not specific to React. This is basic JavaScript functionality uh, and it's stuff you, you should know. And you, you know, and you should have opinions about it, right? You should, you should be familiar enough with these different options that you have opinions and you think about when you should use one versus the other. Pick the one you prefer for a start and then consult this reference again if you forget how the other ones work. Lotjar says, this has helped me a lot with JS. Yeah, it's good to review this stuff in multiple contexts, right? Yep. Uh, so in React, you control branching logic with JavaScript. Um, you can return JSX conditionally with an if statement. Um, and you can also save JSX in a variable, just like we do in JavaScript and include it inside other JSX by using curly braces. Um, and then, you know, a reminder of how ternaries are written, and then a reminder of how double ampersands are written. And these shortcuts are common, but you don't have to use them. That's the most important thing to remember. Despite what Code Wars tries to tell you, you do not have to use either of these ternaries or double ampersands if you aren't comfortable and it makes your code harder to read then just use an if statement. Ain't nothing wrong with that. All right, now let's do some challenges. So like I talked about before, um, these should be hopefully a little bit easier for you if you already are familiar with JavaScript. So feel free to take a look at these and we're gonna do them together. Uh, Phil Snubble says, Code Wars, are you asking what Code Wars are? Um, so Code Wars are basically challenge problems. It's a website. You can look it up. Um, but it's actually a great way to practice JavaScript concepts and concepts in other languages as well, if you're familiar with other languages. Um, it's basically challenge problems. And as you complete challenge problems, you can go up in levels and do harder problems. Um, and a lot of times these challenge problems resolve, or sorry, revolve around certain concepts. So let's say you want more practice with something like array methods or... Uh, conditionals. Uh, you can filter these questions to revolve around a certain topic in a certain language, uh, and you can really drill and practice. And you get points, and there's leaderboards and all that sort of thing. And so it, it gamifies a little bit uh, if you want to feel, if you like that that dopamine rush from you know winning. <laughs> if you like, if you if you like to compete and you like to win, uh, you can you know pay attention to your rank and get more points for harder problems and that kind of thing. But if you don't, you can just practice certain concepts. Um, and stay at one level forever. It's really up to you, but it's good for, it's, it's like, you know, brain flashcards. Um, and Latjor says, I prefer if statements and that's fine. Yeah, you are perfectly allowed to do that. Uh, so let's look at this question here. What are they asking? Challenge one of three, show an icon for incomplete items using a ternary. Using the conditional operator, uh, sorry, use the conditional operator to render an X if is packed isn't true. So I'm going to let you guys do this one because I think you can. Um, so in the chat, whenever you figure it out, go ahead and, and, and modify our item, um, our item component here to not only, so right now all it's doing is using the double ampersand 
to render a check mark if is packed is true, right? Um, go ahead and put in chat how we might convert this into a ternary to also render an, at, an X if is packed is false. So I'm going to have you guys do this one. And then what we'll do is we'll test it out and make sure it works. <laughs> Lost Spark says, so are we chat GPT now? Yeah, I'm, I'm crowdsourcing this. <laughs> I'm just going to let you all sit there while I do all the work. <laughs> you got to engage. Yeah. Uh, Chimp, I'll see if I can. And um, I think that's about as big as I can. I think any bigger and we're going to start cutting stuff off on the screen. I hope that's okay. Hey, Madeline. So we have, uh, we've talked about props, Madeline, but we haven't talked about state yet. So um, we're missing that other half of the equation there. We'll probably be talking about state on our next stream where we'll start to join the, um, the, the two halves of props and state together and get into that sort of interactivity of hooks and that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. All right. I think, yes, I think you all have got the correct answer. So let's plug it in and see if it works. Now, I've got some notes here that I, where I already have the, the, those emoji pasted. So I'm going to just drop this in. All right. Hey, look at that. Good deal. So we can prove that this works by changing a true to a false. And as we do, we can see that it re-renders and it's using the appropriate logic. Hey, thank you for the follow there, X. Uh, Madeline says, the second question is kitten season started. No, but it was about 60 degrees today. So I imagine kitten season is coming right down the pike. I think we're finally done with freezing uh, where I'm at. I think we're finally done uh, with having nights that are below freezing or at least mostly. Um, and so I can, I can feel it. It's coming. My kitten sense is tingling. Uh, for those of you who are like, okay, what the hell? Um, so I foster kittens and I often show them on stream. Uh, so as soon as kittens start being born this spring, I'm certainly going to be fostering and uh, I will supply kittens on stream and allow folks to name them uh, as soon as I have some. All right, Fuel says, from what I'm used to is packed Double ampersand X needs to be read many times. It needs to be read many times. I kind of like the neatness, but I don't know what it does. Um, I'm hoping I understand the question, but essentially um, what the double ampersand does is it just evaluates to see if the condition, so if the condition on the left of the double ampersand is true, then the condition, then the whatever is on the right of the double ampersand um, is evaluated. If the condition on the left of the double ampersand is false, then whatever is on the right of the double ampersand is not evaluated. So it just controls whether or not that whatever is on the right of those ampersands is evaluated at all. I hope I understand your question. <laughs> Thanks, Madeline. Hope the job is going well. Sirius says more doggos. Yeah, I need to have a I need to have a channel reward for my dog. Yeah. All right, so that wasn't too bad, right? I think compared to some of the challenges next uh, last week, this is like man walk in the park, hit it out of the park. <laughs> He's like a cartoon character where we never see his face. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he's snoozing on the couch right now. I would angle the camera down, but I have some like, you know, dirty dishes in view and I, I don't want y'all to see that. So I ate lunch in here. So I didn't, I didn't take the dirty dishes out, but maybe next time. Um, so fuel, I assume you're talking about, so I'll just reset this real quick. Oof. Hang on. 
let's do this. All right, so I'm going back to the original expression here. Um, Fuel says, if is packed is false, then the expression is false. Well, it, essentially what this is saying is, if is packed is false, then this is not evaluated at all. It's like a short circuit. So if is packed is true, then the evaluation continues and evaluates whatever is on the right of the ampersand. If is packed is false, then this is simply not considered. Nothing is done. It does not continue. Okay. But doesn't it then render the false? Are you talking about React rendering the false? No. So uh, up a, up above a little bit, I'm gonna I need to zoom out just a little bit so I can find this text. Um, they explain that up above a little bit farther here. Let's find it. Okay. React considers false. So if the condition on the left for the for the double ampersands, if the condition on the left evaluates to false, React considers false as a whole in the JSX tree, just like null or undefined, and it doesn't render anything. Okay. So React, if that if, if if in a double ampersand condition, then the condition on the left is false, then it's just it like it, that whatever's on the right doesn't exist. It's a whole, it doesn't get rendered, it doesn't get touched. Yeah. Okay. Good question though. It's good to, it's good to really understand this stuff because this is um like like we mentioned before, th these expression types aren't just unique to React, right? You can use them in JavaScript. You can use them wherever you want in JavaScript and they can do the same things. So it's really good to know how to use them. Oh, thank you, NoCaffeine. Good to see you. All right, let's look at the next challenge. So now we get to practice double ampersands. What a great segue. <laughs> All right. Challenge two of three. Uh, in this example, each item receives a numerical importance prop. Use the double ampersand operator to render importance colon x, excuse me, uh, in italics, but only for items that have non-zero importance. <laughs> Thank you for the follow. Get push, get paid. I love that. That's a great, that is a great name. Get push, get paid. Don't we all wish we could do that? So use the double ampersand operator to render uh, importance X in italics, but only for items that have non-zero importance. Your item list should end up looking like this. So spacesuit importance nine, helmet with golden leaf, and then photo of Tam, which has importance of six. Don't forget to add a space between the two labels. <laughs> get push, get oops is my next name. Also valid. Get good. Yeah, oh man. Somebody somebody better claim that uh get push get good um Twitch name, otherwise I will. All right, so let's look at the code. We essentially want to change this so it so it renders so it looks like this. Um now this middle one here has an importance of zero, so it shouldn't render anything for the text or styling there. All right, so here we've got, we're passing in, you know, we're, 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 we're calling our item component three times. Uh, each time we're passing in different props and then those props then, you know, control the behavior of our component. <laughs> it exists, crap, get oof. <laughs> yeah. All right, so they want us to specifically use the double ampersand operator. All right. So essentially we want to say, and we're just basically, we're, I'm going to scroll up a little bit because we're basically just going to be looking at this part, th this component here. This is where all the logic is going to happen, right? So essentially, if the importance is zero, then don't do anything, right? 
So since we're using the double ampersand operator, essentially we want to say is if the importance is anything other than zero, which I guess it's going to be an integer greater than zero, <laughs> then render all of that styling. So we still want the name to show up, so I'm not going to change that. But I also want that importance text to show. So what that text should look like is probably going to be, I'm just going to write out the, the tags first. Um, and it's going to be something like, uh, we can probably just use an italics tag here. I know we don't normally like to do that kind of styling, but we're, we're baddies here. So we'll do that. We want italics. If I could type, all right, we want some italics. And then we're going to say, um, I'm going to add the condition after I get the styling working. We're going to say importance. And inside of importance, we essentially just want to say whatever that value is. Because I think that's going to be passed in. Uh, each item receives a numerical importance prop. So we can just say importance. And oh, close parenthesis. OK, so right now, everything is showing up with a value of important. So I'm gonna add one more space there. There we go, that looks better. So everything is showing up with a value of importance. Now, how would I use that um, double ampersand operator to turn it off if I didn't want importance to show up? And it looks like justice is already a, well, yeah, you could say if importance, yeah. So you could use the, the, the exclamation point equals equals to that, that not operator there. So that would that would control for you know values that could be less than zero. I'm going to assume here that it's always going to be an integer that is greater than or equal to zero. So maybe a, a bit more restrictive. But um, I think I'm going to think about it in terms of um, we can just say importance greater than zero, and then ampersand ampersand. And I want the right side of my ampersand ampersand to be in my curly braces and only return if importance is greater than zero. Okay, so what we're doing here is we're just saying, hey, if importance is greater than zero, then render this list item with this text and you know pulling in the importance value. If importance is not greater than zero, then don't do anything. Just return the name. Yes, and that's, yep, that's a great catch there, Justice, exactly. So I think this was before you joined Piece of Shoot, but there's a very important pitfall when we're talking about the short circuit operator. Um, and let's go back to it just because I think, I'm sure this is why they've asked the question. Um, Yeah, I'm, I'm sure this is why they've asked the question. Because if we do this, let's just see what happens here. If we do this, yeah, watch what happens. Watch what happens when I did that. When I tried to use the the true the, the, the truthiness and false, falsiness that's inherent in JavaScript, because yeah, we know that one and zero are one is truthy and zero is falsy. So why can't we just do importance ampersand ampersand whatever? That should work, right? But look what happened. Look at that. It rendered zero. <laughs> oh no. It rendered zero. It, it, it said, all right, yeah, this is zero. I'm just going to render it. <laughs> yeah. And so that is a pitfall when you're trying to use the double ampersand. I, I'm so glad that you, um, yeah, <laughs> I'm so glad that you, uh, that you asked that question or that you stated that piece of shoot because it's really important to see that that's true in practice, right? So we just have to convert it to a Boolean. And there's several ways you could do that, but I think this is the most, this is the easiest to follow is just saying, all right, important is greater than zero, true or false, do the thing. Engagement, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And so if you wanna read about that pitfall, um, it's a little higher up on the page, right up here, where they say, don't put numbers on the left side of a double ampersand, yep. 
All right, so I think that works. I would say it's fairly readable. Does everybody understand what we did here? Any questions on what we did in order to solve this uh, this challenge or you know, what we did, why it works, what it's doing, anything like that? <laughs> yeah, actually that conversation did help with engagement. <laughs> Got more viewers now. <laughs> yeah, and for double ampersands, I mean, you really, it's just, just, you know, it's not necessarily don't put numbers, just put Booleans on the left side of a double ampersand if you want to be safe. Do stuff that evaluates the Booleans. All right. I don't see any questions, but as always, feel free to ask. So let's go on to the third challenge and then we'll take our break and we'll go on to the next section. We're doing really good. All right, I think there's only three challenges on this one, yeah. So, uh, oh, this is good. Challenge three of three, refactor a series of ternary operators to if and variables. So this drink component uses a series of ternary conditions to show different information depending on whether the name prop is tea or coffee. The problem is that the information about each drink is spread across multiple conditions. Refactor this code to use a single if statement instead of three ternary conditions. So this is an example maybe where ternary was not the best choice and we should probably just go back to basics and use ifs. Thank you for the follow, N Niloy is gone. <laughs> so what are they doing here? What are they, okay, let me scroll down a little. What are we doing? Uh, and I might open this one in a new window because it's a little wider. So if you ever wanna see any of these examples in, an, in a new window, you can just click the fork button. You see where my mouse is up here on the right? You can click fork. And that will open in, in a new window sandbox, which you can, you know, control the size and make things a little bit more readable. All right. So what they're doing here is they're building a, a, a table, basically an unformatted table. And we've got part of plant. Then we've got the content here with the ternary and then caffeine content. And then, um, it's essentially just checking to see if something is, let's see, what are we doing here? We are passing in tea or coffee. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's basically just make, it's basically just determining whether the prop that we're passing in is tea or coffee and delivering the right information depending on whether it's tea or coffee. So if it's tea, then part of the plant is the leaf. And if it's coffee, part of the plant is the bean, right? Makes sense. And same thing for the caffeine content and same thing for the age as well. So there's a few different ways that we could do this, but you know, this is obviously very repetitive, right? We're checking to see if the prop that we're passing in is T three separate times. I think we really should Oh, thank you for the uh, hydrate there. Thank you. I think what we should do is um, only check once and then deliver all of the content if something is T, right? Set all set all of our variables, set, set a bunch of variables to say like, all right, um, check once to see if it's T and then set the variables appropriately. And then if it's not T, which is probably gonna be coffee, but we can do another check and say, all right, if it's coffee, then set those variables appropriately. So we should only do the check for each one time and then assign all of our variables at once rather than doing it three separate times like they're doing here. So, and I think what I wanna do is pull out this logic and put it up above. We're, we're gonna make things more readable by pulling that logic out of the return statement and only returning the results. So what I wanna do, and this is not how you have to do it. This is how I'm thinking, this is how I think I want to do it, but it's up to you how you do it. 
So I think I'm going to set some variables that are going to hold this information. We've got the part of the plant, we've got the caffeine, and we've got the age, right? So I'm going to say let part. Now I cannot spell caffeine, so I'm probably going to spell it wrong at least once. C-A-F-F-E-I-N-E. -F -F -E -E. Gosh, the English language sucks. <laughs> I before E except after C, right? Let part, caffeine, and age. So I'm going to set these variables up so I can use them later. And then I can just say, oh, don't capitalize yourself, come on. And then I can just say, um, if name, if name equals T, then I'm going to set all the variables with the proper values for T. Okay, so part is going to equal leaf and uh, caffeine. Please autocomplete. Thank you. Caffeine is going to be whatever this value. And then age is going to be, wow, 4,000 years. All right. And I think, oh, thank you for the follow there, Jan Cassio. So after we've assigned T, we could probably just do an else statement here and you know put everything in the else. Um, but we don't know for sure that the only two options are only ever going to be uh, tea and coffee. We might want to add additional options later on. So I am going to go ahead and just add, you could just do an else here if you wanted, um, but I think I'm going to do an else if. Um, else if uh, name equals coffee. Um, and then everything else is going to go in there. So I'm going to copy and paste this and just change the values. So really, we're just reassigning the values based on whatever prop is passed in. All right. Now it's now we need to, but now we need to go ahead and update the return statement so that um, we're pulling in those variables in the appropriate locations. Switch it up. Yeah, if we had more conditions, I would actually recommend a switch statement here. Um, you know, if we had like four or five, I would say absolutely. If, rather than doing multiple else's, uh, else ifs, I would just be like, all right, switch it up, baby. Let's go, my faves. Um, hey, no worries, Lajor. See you next time. All right, so now this is actually going to make the return section a lot more readable because we're getting all this nonsense out of the way. We're getting all the logical nonsense out of the way beforehand. So we can now we can just say, all right, um, part, whatever the result of that is, and then we're going to grab caffeine, which I cannot spell. Caffeine, there we go and age. So now our return statement is going to look a lot better. And I probably have, I think I have a, uh, yeah, so I have a, probably a parenthesis error here somewhere. Let's see what it is. Let's see. Do, 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 part caffeine age, name equals, oh, I'll, and this should probably be a triple equals too. There we go. Oh, and I have an extra bracket there. There we go. Ah, hooray. So now I feel like this looks a lot cleaner because all of our logical operations are done. And then in the return statement, all we're doing is spitting back the variables. Oh, thank you for that, Jan Cassio. Good catch. Coming in hot with a first time chat, <laughs> catching mistakes. Way to go. <laughs> I love it. All my first time chatters are so sharp. Y'all are just like, boom. That's the best part. Or I feel like maybe sometimes folks are lurking and then they're like, ooh. I got the perfect first time chat and then they drop it in there and I love it. And yeah, so Justice, I see your solution there. You could absolutely, there's, that's the best part about this is that there's a lot of different ways that you can refactor it in order to um, 
you know, in, in order to make sense to you. However, in this case, just speci specifically in this case, they asked us to specifically use if statements. So yes, there's other, definitely other ways you could do it, but they did, the question did ask specifically for an if statement. So that's why we use that here. Um, it is also very simple and basic, right? It's just like, look, what you see, what you get, all that. But yeah, there's other ways you could do it. Uh, in this case, they did ask for an if statement. So that's why we did, they asked for an if statement and variables. So that's why we did that. <laughs> it just came at the right time. Absolutely. <laughs> all right. So I feel like this is, this seems to be working. And if we were to, um, you know, change our props, like if we, if I made both of these coffee, we would see this change. Oops. I can't spell coffee either. Dang. There we go. So now when, when I change them both to coffee, obviously the, the logic is going to render them both the same way. And so we can see that that's working properly. All right. Good stuff. So that's all the challenges for this particular section. So I think this is a great stopping point for a break. Are there any questions before we take our next break? Feel free to ask if you have any questions about what we did or why. Um, I would highly suggest, you know, don't just sit there and watch me do it. Um, you know, follow along, do these, uh, do these examples and challenges yourself. Maybe come back after the stream and do them again and make sure that you've fully, you know, sort of comprehended and remember uh, what we talked about. That's why these challenges are here. Um, and you can do them in the sandbox or you can do them right here in the browser window. John Cassio says, oh, so this is the new React Docs. Yeah, so uh, just a couple weeks ago, um, the React Docs, yeah. So the, these React Docs were in beta for a very long time, like a long time. Um, but just a couple weeks ago, right after I started talking about it, I was just saying, I think they heard me. I think they heard me start streaming about it and they were like, oh crap, MindWolf is starting to stream the docs. We got to get them out of beta. We got to release them. And so they did. Now these are the official React Docs. Um, the older docs are still available. I think if you need them for reference, um, but I think you have to dig a little bit to find them. Um, they are still, they're still out there, but they are no longer the official docs. Oh gosh, finally it looks much better. Yeah, they do. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, and, and you can, you know, find the, all the latest stuff for using React in your applications uh, under, under the installation header here. Uh, if you do actually want to use React to build things, um, you can you know, check out this installation header uh, and see the, the, the official recommendations there uh, and how to, you know, all the various tools and things you can use in order to get React inside of your applications, which I think we will do. Um, we've done it before here on stream. We've used several options for deploying React uh, applications here on stream. We've built project with React. Uh, so I think after we're done going through the docs, we will build something with React just to kind of show it in action. Uh, I'm working on a personal project with React right now. It might be a little bit complex for showing on stream, but maybe we'll see. We'll see how it ends up. <laughs> might be worth it. The React team needed that. <laughs> I'll allow that one. The React team needed that kick in the butt. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, John Cassio. So uh, we actually did a we actually deployed a project with Vite um, uh, right before we started talking about these docs. So if you want to see how to use Vite, um, we did it just like maybe a month ago. Uh, it's, I think it's still here on Twitch. Um, I'll be moving it to my YouTube channel soon as well. So yeah, we did something with Vite. It's it's very it's very just snappy. Yeah, I like Vite. All right, let's go ahead and take our break. And then when we come back, we're gonna go on to the next section, which is all about rendering lists. So, um, and this is, again, this is gonna be another thing that's probably familiar to you. Uh, if you have used a framework like EJS, um, or, I mean, are just familiar with, um, you know, looping through objects in general, uh, I, th I think you probably won't find this to be too strenuous and you can ace the challenges at the end. So we'll take five minutes and then we'll come back to this. All right, please do get up, get a drink. I know I'm, I need more, I need more hydration. So uh, I'll see y'all back here in five. Thank you for the follow Coton 10. Stick around after the break and we're gonna learn some more React. 
so many new followers. I love it. Okay, folks, we got about a minute left in the break, so come on back when you're ready. Please do get up and stretch. If you've if you've been sitting down, if you've been on my stream this entire time and you've been sitting down, like change to a different position. It's not good for y'all to be sitting that long. Get up, stretch. You know, if you're able to do so, get up. Uh, walk around the room once. Stretch your shoulders. Stretch your neck. I stand up when I stream, but uh, during the breaks, I always go and sit down because it's just changing to an opposite position than what I've been doing. All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop the timer. Oh, it's about to be tea. And get my camera back on, maybe eventually. All right, welcome back, folks. <laughs> Those breaks are so important. It helps us keep ourselves limber and healthy and, you know, not get a blood clot in our legs. 
<laughs> from sitting so long. So it is very valuable and you should uh, take advantage of those breaks. Um, that's why we do them. And I've got some fresh hydration. So this is some like pomegranate, sugar-free pomegranate uh, fruit punch. It looks like, I don't know, blood or something. <laughs> It's not. It's pomegranate punch, but it's it's very dark red, and if it touches anything, it immediately stains. Like, you know, if you get a drop on anything, it's an immediate stain. So I'm just basically just trying to drink it all so that I don't have to have it around the house anymore. But there is at least a 50% chance I will knock this glass over at some point and stain literally everything. So stay tuned for that. You can take bets on the side. <laughs> oh, y'all are funny. Okay, let's talk about uh, rendering lists. So this is something that we do a lot, right? A lot of the times when we are pulling something out of a database, um, <laughs> stay in tune. Oh, that's, that's great. Very good. That is a good one. That's, that's pun of the stream right there. Um, all right, so that's it. so rendering lists conditionally, specifically conditionally rendering lists, or dynamic. Sorry, I should say dynamically rendering lists is something that we do a lot. Um, we will often be, you know, taking in a user input, and then maybe pulling some information out of a database. And it could be a list. It could be a list that has zero entries, or it could be a list that has a hundred. Um, it could be the, the, the options in that list might vary depending on what the user has given us, right? Depending on what, what goes in is gonna, is gonna control what comes out. And a lot of the times that list and content, um, the list length and the list content is going to vary pretty highly, right? So we don't ever wanna hard code these lists. We want to conditionally um, and dynamically render them. This is something you've seen a lot if you've worked with EJS or um, something similar, you oftentimes you'll find yourself taking an array or something like something similar to that, looping through it and essentially uh, creating as many list items as you need to for every single item in that array. And so that's really what we're going to be practicing here. And thank you for the follow, Mitroni. So you'll learn how to render components from an array using the map uh, method how to render only specific components using filter, and when and why to use React keys. Now, this third bullet point is, is extremely important. So even if you think, oh, I already know how to use array methods. I am a pro at using array methods to loop through arrays and render stuff. Like, I know that already. I'm gonna drop off the stream right now. I would suggest that you stick around for when we talk about this specific bullet point that is something unique to React that's very crucial when you are um, you know, talking about these, these, these types of lists and rendering lists. Okay, so rendering data from arrays. Say that you have a list of contents. So here we've got list items, it contains a name and then a profession. Um, yeah, keys are very important to learn, absolutely, yeah something you, you may not have seen before. So, all right. So the only difference among these list items is their contents, right? The structure for each is just li tags. So those are the same for every item. What's different is their contents. You will often need to show several instances of the same component using different data when building interfaces from lists of comments to galleries of profile images. Yeah, lists are really the bread and butter of most, I mean, most pages, right? It's so many things contain lists of a certain type. Um, in these situations, you can store that data in JavaScript objects and arrays and use methods like map and filter to render lists of components from them. Here's a short example of how to generate a list of items from an array. So essentially we're, we're taking the same um, contents and we're just moving them into an array called people. Then we map the people members into a new array of JSX nodes called list items. So now what we're doing instead is we're creating a new array and we are taking the first array 
using the array method called map. And we are looping through each person in the people array and turning it into a list item that contains all the content for that person. Right? We're just we're just basically taking that and we're wrapping it in li tags. That's all we're doing. We've we've probably done this before for EJS stuff, right? You you take your content and you wrap it in an li tag and you loop through and capture that for every single item in the array. And then finally, we just take that new array that we created and we wrap it in ul tags. So to finalize our list, we need to wrap our li's in a ul and then that's what we return. So here's the results. Now you can see there's an error down here and we'll get to that in a minute, <laughs> but it still works, right? It still, it still gives us the, the expected result. We have a list with all of the objects in it. Now it's a notice the sandbox above displays a console error. Warning, each child in a list should have a unique key prop. This is something you may not have seen before when you're working with something like EJS or something else. Um, it's something that React requires specifically. So you'll learn how to fix this error later on on the page. But before we get to that, let's add some structure to the data. So we can use additional array methods um, other than map, right? So what we're doing here is we are adding some additional meat to our array. So we still have the outer array here, but inside of that array, we are now turning it into an array of objects rather than just an array of strings. So each array item is now an object that contains multiple uh, properties, right? We have our ID, we have our name, and we have our profession for each item in the array. Uh, so a, a Weiss, um, we're going to be talking about that in just a minute. Don't worry, stick with me. And we're going to talk about what key values are and why we need them, okay? But yes, we will answer that question in just a sec. So we have an array of individual objects here. And let's say we want to, we want a way to only show people whose profession is chemist. You can use JavaScript's filter method to return just those people. And again, this is just a job. These are, we're just doing a sort of kind of a review of JavaScript array methods here. This method takes an array of items, passes them through a test, which is just a, a function that returns true or false, and then returns a new array of only the items that pass that test. You only want the items where profession is chemist. Then the test function for this looks like essentially checking to see where person.profession is equal to chemist. So we can create a new array of just chemists by calling filter on the people and doing that same filter. So we're just saying const chemists equals people.filter, looping through each person and checking to see if they are a chemist and only adding them to our new chemist array if their profession is equal to chemists. So we've done that filter and now we can map over our chemist array and give it additional properties, right? So we're giving it an image, we are giving it some styling, uh, we're, we're pulling out their accomplishments and all that sort of thing. So really the only difference here is that we did a filter first to get only the chemists before we then did a map and added all of our tags and you know some additional styling to these. Okay, and then finally in the end we, we return the UL with all of the contents. Now you, we know that you can do what we call chaining, which is where you stack multiple methods on top of each other. So that's another possibility. Um, but I mean, I would say in this case, I, I think this is valid to just filter first down to the only the chemists and then um, do a map and add all the tags because they're kind of separate operations. So I don't know. So they're showing it how that works down here. We're filtering down to our chemists first and storing them in a variable called chemists. 
and then taking that and mapping over it, adding all the tags and re returning the result as a list. So uh, despite the fact that we started out as of, we started out with an array of five people, right? One, two, three, four, five. We started out with an array of five people. At the end, we only end up with our two chemists in the list, okay? So if you're familiar with array methods, this probably makes sense. Um, but if you're not familiar, this might be a little bit wild. Like, whoa, what is happening here? So feel free to ask if you're not familiar with array methods, um, such as filter and map. If you're not sure what's going on, um, do feel free to ask. If you're not familiar with array methods, I would highly suggest maybe doing some code wars. Um, looking at uh, the website javascript.io has a chapter on array methods and with examples. And I found that really useful for reference when I was learning. So I would suggest, you know, some of those resources are great for practice. And then we have a little pitfall here. Uh, so arrow functions, such as when we're using map, inside of map, we are setting up an arrow function using the arrow syntax here. So arrow functions implicitly return the expression right after the arrow. So you don't need a return statement. Exactly. So yeah, arrow functions are more compact in that way. We don't need to write a return statement. We can just use the arrow. However, you must write a return explicitly if your arrow is followed by a curly brace. So that's kind of how, how arrow functions work, right? If we have a single line arrow function, um, then we don't need a, 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 a we don't need to write a return statement. However, if we have a block body function like this, we can write more than one line of code, but we also need to explicitly define our return. So that's just kind of a a, a characteristic of arrow functions and something to remember. So you can write very comp you can write very compact one line implied returns, but if you want more than one line, you need to use curly braces and explicitly declare your return. Um, piece of sheet says you can replace curly braces with parentheses to avoid the return, right? Um, let's see, can we edit this? No, we can't edit this. Um, to be honest, I don't remember off the top of my head. Does anybody know? I don't recall if that works or not. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll get the chance to try it a little bit later. Off the top of my head, I do not recall. But that's something you can definitely try in the, in the browser sandbox. All right, so now this is the part, this is really the meat of, um, the next part here is really the meat of how React is a little bit different than what you may have encountered before uh, when you are dynamically rendering lists in other ways. Um, as we saw before, in the console, we keep getting this error that says, warning each child in a list should have a unique key prop. And we're like, what the flip is that? What is it? What do they mean by this? Each child on a list should have a unique key prop. So let's let's see what that means. It says notice all the sandboxes show an error. Um, you need to give each array item a key, a string or number that uniquely identifies it among other items in that array. So these list items are going to look a little different than the LIs that we may be familiar with from vanilla JavaScript we're gonna have an additional attribute here called key, key equals something. And that something needs to be a unique identifier for each item in the list. It says JSX elements directly inside of a map always need keys. Why? As somebody asked earlier, as a wise asked earlier, they said, well, why? What is the purpose of adding a key prop? Um, well, keys tell React which array item each component corresponds to so that it can match them up later. This becomes important if your array items can move. 
for example, due to sorting, get inserted, or get deleted. A well-chosen key helps React infer what exactly has happened and make the correct update to the DOM. And so essentially what that's saying is that, you know, when you have interactivity with an array, um, it's highly likely that those array items are going to get reshuffled, get changed, get inserted, get deleted, get sorted, get rearranged. And React needs to be able to keep track of them with some type of unique identifier. It needs to say, all right, this specific unique thing was, let's say, item one in the array but all of a sudden you sorted it. And now the thing that was item one in the array is no longer the first thing. So where did it go? React needs to know, oh, that specific unique item is now at the bottom. They sorted it, they rearranged it. So it needs to know exactly how and what to update in the DOM when it um, sends new information to the browser. It needs to know exactly what to update, what to leave alone, what has changed, what has moved. It needs to keep track of every single item in that array. And you might say, well, okay, can it just read what's in the list item? Can it, can it just read it? Well, what if you have two items that have the same text? That's going to happen quite often, probably, right? You might have items that have the same text. You might have items that Maybe the, the interior text on that item has been completely changed. You know, someone updated a misspelling in a name and all of a sudden that item no longer has the same text. And so that's not a reliable way of identifying that list item. You've changed the text. What you need is a unique identifier that, is, that doesn't rely on the contents because those contents themselves are often going to be updated, they might be identical to another item. Um, you need a truly unique identifier. Okay. Anna Ben, thank you for the follow. I hope that makes sense. I hope that makes sense to you. Um, Hawaii says, well, what if somehow two elements have the same ID? What would happen then? Yeah, so essentially that's, that's the point of having these IDs is that they need to be unique. Um, and so there's several different ways that you can create unique IDs. Um, if you're pulling information from a database, from any database, generally, well, I mean, MongoDB auto generates unique IDs for you. So you will never have that problem, right? You, you will always have a unique ID that you can pull down from like a MongoDB database. And generally, if you're looking at a relational database, like a SQL database, um, you're going to have some kind of a unique ID also. Um, if your tables are, are well built, <laughs> you don't necessarily have to, but generally the key of that table is going to, be, so SQL tables already generally have a key. Um, and so you will have some kind of a unique identifier. Um, and, and so generally, if you're pulling from a database, you can just grab that information and use that as your keys. Um, but there's also ways that you can generate keys within your code. So within your JavaScript or your JSX, you can, uh, there's plugins you can install or, you, or packages you can install that can generate keys for you. Um, but we're going to see some examples of that that are pretty simple, but still allow you to use unique values. That's a good question, though. Um, and it says, and it does say, rather than generating keys on the fly, you should include them in your data. And so generally, I think in most cases, you will be pulling data out of a database somewhere. Um, and so you, this will be true. You will have them in your data. It's going to come down from the database in whatever object you're pulling. Um, and so you can just use that unique identifier, whatever that is. And so here, the keys are very simple. We just have an ID value, which is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, blah, blah, blah. Um, and these IDs are unique, and so they are valid to be used as a key. So how do we do that then? I'm going to skip this for just a second. Um, we'll come back to that. But um, it says, you know, where, and also where to get your key. Uh, so different sources of data provide different sources of keys. And as I mentioned, if you're getting your data from a database, you can use the database keys. Just don't make it hard. Just do that. If you're generating your data locally, 
Um, you can use an incrementing counter. So you can just set up a counter that loops through integers, or you could use a, a method like crypto.random or a package such as UUID. Uh, I've used UUID before. Uh, it generates just a very long string for you um, for every single item, and it'll just drop that in. Um, and so there's lots of different ways you can do it. Um, there's a few rules here when we're talking about keys. And keys must be unique among siblings. So what that means is that for items that are in the same list, they need to have unique IDs. However, you could use the same keys for nodes in different arrays. So if you, if you have multiple lists on your page, you could have, you know, each of those start with an uh, start with an ID of zero, one, two, three, four, five, and use that for your keys um, for every single list on the page. And like I said before, you know, if you're pulling this data from a database, each item probably already has a unique ID, but this is something you just kind of need to be aware of if you are generating your own IDs. And the other important thing is that keys must not change. Again, if you're pulling data from a database, that's probably not a problem. Um, your keys are probably going to remain static and be, you know, generated at the time when the data was generated and they're not going to change. Uh, however, if you are generating your own keys using something like U UUID or whatever, you do not want to regenerate them each time you render the list. That defeats the purpose. React can't keep track of the items and it's not going to know what item matches to uh, what item in the previous list. Okay. And here we're going to get into more of why React needs keys. So imagine that files on your desktop didn't have names. Instead, you'd refer to them by their order, the first, the second, blah, blah, blah. You could get used to it, but once you delete a file, it would get confusing. The second file becomes the first file, third file becomes the second file, and so on. File names in a folder and JSX keys in an array serve a similar purpose. They uniquely identify an item between its siblings, and a well-chosen key provides more information than the position within the array. Even if the position changes due to reordering, the key lets React identify that item through its lifetime. And you might be tempted to use an item's index in the array as its key. So for example, you might just be like, all right, well, I have this list of items. I want to quickly set up some index, or sorry, I want to quickly set up some keys for them. I'm just going to give them, you know, zero, one, two, three, because that's where they're at in the array. That's what React will use if you don't specify a key at all. It'll say, all right, I'm going to use indexes. But the order in which you render items will change over time if an item is inserted, deleted, or gets reordered. Index as a key often leads to subtle and confusing bugs. So if an item has a key of zero, but you reorder that array, and key zero is now at the end, that's probably going to be confusing for somebody in the future. Also, don't generate keys on the fly, for example, using something like math.random. This will cause keys to never match up between renders, leading to all your components and DOM being recreated every time. Not only is this slow, but it will also lose any user input inside the list items. Instead, use a stable ID based on the data. And yeah, so the reason we don't want to do something like math.random is just because the whole point of React is that it only re-renders what it needs to, right? If something doesn't change, it's not going to touch it. And so the reason why keys are so important from a, from a performance standpoint is because we don't want to touch what we don't have to. If something doesn't change, we're going to leave it alone. But if the indexes keep changing every single time, React will rebuild that list every single time, even if it doesn't have to. And when we get into very large lists, that's actually going to cause performance impacts. And you're also going to lose things like user inputs. Um, and so you really want to be careful about your keys and making them stable, unchangeable, um, 
and descriptive in a way that allows React to track the life cycle of that item over time. OK, questions on what keys are, why we need them, what they're for, uh, why we should use them, anything about that. Haven't knocked over my drink yet, so I might finish it before I do. All right, so I want to go back to this. Again, feel free to ask questions at any time. You don't got to wait until I pause. You can ask, you can ask whenever you have a question. Um, but we're going to go back up to this deep dive here and talk a little bit, bit about this. So, hey, Hang, welcome to the stream. Hey, quick update on where we're at in the lesson. So uh, we did it. First thing we did earlier in the stream was a review of props, which we talked about last time. So we just kind of reviewed the concept of props. We've gone through conditional rendering, so basically using things like ternary operators and double ampersands to conditionally render stuff <laughs> based on whether a value is true or false. Then we choose whether to display or not display certain elements, right? Uh, and now we're talking about rendering lists uh, within React components and the uniqueness of React um, in that it requires keys in order to properly keep track of list items, right? That's not something we're used to necessarily, but we now have a, an extra key attribute that we need to add to our list items in order to allow React to keep track of where every item in that list is located. Uh, Awai says, so basically keys allow React to keep, to keep track of each thing. So if it gets changed, only that is updated instead of all the DOM. Hence, saving processing and being faster. Yes, that's a great summary. Yep. Because no matter what keys allow us to do is no matter if, uh, let's say, an item's text gets completely rewritten or, you know, somebody capitalizes something that wasn't capitalized before or um, an item gets deleted, say, that's that's going to change, you know, the, the nature of not only that item, but potentially the, the order of the list. Um, the order of every single other item in that list, uh, it could have a ripple effect throughout the entire list. And so you need to make sure that you have a unique way of tracking list items that doesn't depend on the order of the items or their content. And so the best way to do that is to assign each list item a unique value that is separate from its contents. And like I said before, that's usually something that you're gonna get by default from your database. And when you built apps in the past, you've probably just filtered out that ID, right? You know, you, you, your MongoDB database has a unique ID assigned to every document and you get it back from the database, but you filter it out. You don't, you don't ever use it. Um, but, or, you know, you might use it for, for other logical operations, joining things together, that kind of thing. But now you're actually gonna wanna pull that in as the key value for your list item. Uh, Randy Crumb says, is key like the this word in vanilla JS? Um, I often think of this as more of like referring to like a parent component of some kind. Um, so you want to refer back to the, the, the containing, so you have, a, you have an item and you want to refer back to um, its sort of parent. So I would say key is more of just like an ID tag or maybe for folks who are um, in the US, maybe it's more like your social security number. Um, so, or if you're in another country you know, and you have some kind of a, a country ID, uh, it's more like that. So I could change my name, potentially change my gender. I could change my appearance. I could cut my hair. I could style my hair. I could shave my head. I could change my clothes. Um, you know, I don't know, I could get a tan um, and I could look completely different. However, my social security number is always going to stay the same. And so if I'm doing my taxes, they can tell who I am based on my social security number. So maybe that's a way to think about it. You know, I could, and I've changed my appearance a lot over the years. I've, you know, I've had, you know, hair that was an inch long. Uh, I've worn glasses. I've worn different styles of clothes. And so I've looked very different in the past. 
Um, but my social security number never changes. And so that's how I'm able to be identified year over year. So I hope that helps a little bit in thinking about what keys are for, because basically, yeah, your social security number in the U S is like the key and you are the, you are the list item content. <laughs> All right, great questions. So feel free to ask additional questions if you have, if you have them, but we're gonna go ahead and look at this deep dive here. So displaying several DOM nodes for each list item. What do you do when each item needs to render not one, but several DOM nodes? And by that we mean, um, you know, if your list item is complex, and it contains you know, a, a lot of information, um, there is a little bit of a hitch. We know that from, if we're just building out a component, um, we can wrap a component that's meant to deliver multiple tags. Uh, we can wrap that in a fragment, right? We've seen that before. And a fragment is just an empty tag. It's just empty carrots like this right here. That's called a fragment. And so if we have a return statement that's very complex and contains a lot of information, we can wrap it in a fragment and it'll just return all of that bundled all together, no problema. However, when we're talking about lists, there's a little bit of a catch. Fragments won't let us pass a key. So we either need to group them into a div or use the actual fragment spelled out, use the actual fragment tag. And if somebody knows React, if somebody's been a, a, a sort of a veteran React user here, um, y'all used to have to explicitly spell out the word fragment every time. Is, th is that right? Like you couldn't use this little shorthand. You had to actually spell it out every time. Is that true? But either way, um, if you want to um, pass a key, into a complex tag, such as this one here, where we're, where we're returning both um, H1 and paragraph, then we actually have to spell out the word fragment. However, I think probably what you're going to be doing most of the time. So, so what they're doing here is they're mapping. They're so they're mapping through this um, array, and they're for each person in the array, they're returning their name and their bio, right? And so we're looping. We're we're blah, 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 going through the array and returning. Um, the, the name and the bio for each one. Um, and so since we're dealing with an array here, we need to pass through the key and we need to use the fragment tag in order to do that. I mean, most of the time you're probably gonna be using lists and so you can use that key, that, that key attribute in a list, but here's what you need to do if you're looping through something other than a list. Yeah, and I, I guess what I'm asking John Cassio is, um, the uh, shorthand with just the empty carrot, that didn't always exist, right? That's fairly new. You used to have to just type it out every time. And just as a reminder, you will never see those empty carrots or that fragment tag um, and the, you'll never see that the, the empty carrot or the um, fragment tag in the DOM. That always disappears, it goes away. And the only thing that actually renders is what's inside of it. All right. So that's just a little aside for if you're looping through something other than a list, you just need to spell out your fragment tags. Oh, no worries, Giancasio. It's fine. I was just curious about the, the fragment tag itself. So any questions before we go on to the challenges? Let's see if we test our knowledge a little bit on rendering lists and keys. So the key thing is kind of a new topic for us, but if you've, like I say, if you um, have access to a database, if you're getting data from a database, it shouldn't be too hard just to pull that down and pass it through. And I think in a previous stream, um, 
I showed how you can use, how you can, we did a local storage thing with React and I apologize. I don't remember specifically which project it was. If anybody does remember, remember, feel free to share. Um, but we did do a project where I used UUID to generate unique IDs for uh, some keys in a list. All right, so quick recap. We covered how to move data out of components and into data structures, how to generate sets of components with map, how to create arrays of filtered items with filter, and then why and how we need keys. All right. So let's take a look at some of these challenges here. This example shows a list of all people. Change it to show two separate lists one after another, chemists and everyone else. Because <laughs> chemists are the only, uh, chemists are the only people that matter apparently. <laughs> chemists and everyone else. <laughs> like previously, you can determine whether a person is a chemist by checking if person.profession triple equals chemist. And also too, I mean, I'm sure all of you guys know this, but, or maybe you don't, and that's okay. Um, but the triple equals here is um, checking against essentially the, the text and the type because JavaScript being JavaScript, it will try to make things equivalent even if they don't perfectly match. And so if you just use a double equals, um, it doesn't care about type. And so you know a string of zero would be equal to a numeric zero because JavaScript is weird. So that's what the triple equals is for here. Strain said, chemistry is just applied physics with just applied math. Really a list of mathematicians at heart. <laughs> I think there was an XKCD comic about that, right? It was talking about like going back through the, the, the hierarchy of professions. Yeah. There's an XKCD for everything, right? All right. So what do they want us to do? They want us to... Um, change this from a single list of everybody to two separate lists, filtering the first one down to chemist. So I think what we can do here is let's just go back to the example that they gave us. And I'm going to copy that and we're going to drop it in here and we're going to use it because why type something out by hand when we can copy and paste? Boop. I'm going to grab this. And I'm going to, let's see. So our list here is going to be, first thing I want to get the chemists. So chemists is going to filter. And so it's going to basically, it's going to filter our pers our people array, which we're getting here. It's going to filter our people array down to just an array of chemists. And then to get everybody else, we're going to create an array called everyone else or everyone else and we're gonna say not chemist okay quick javascript quiz if i want to change this from a triple equals chemist to the equivalent and say not chemist how would i do that what would i change this triple equals to javascript quiz what do i change this to <laughs> yeah, that was I, I was trying to be tricky there, but y'all are too y'all are too fast for me. Y'all y'all know your stuff. Y'all know your JavaScript basics. Yeah, absolutely. It's not gonna be it's not gonna be this because that doesn't exist, right? Instead, the equivalent in JavaScript is that. Yeah, this is still this is still um, looking at both uh, content and type. Um, it's just applying the not operator, which does the reversed. So this one's just saying, hey, profession not equals chemist, drop it into the array called everyone else. So now we have two arrays, right, which are mutually exclusive. So they, they don't contain the same content. They're mutually exclusive from one another. Um, and I think now we, we're set to return each of these as separate lists. Um, so let's see, what do they want this to look like? Uh, I think what I want is I want 
a, I, I, I'm going to keep this H1 here, just somewhere. Oh, here we go. Um, so I'm going to keep my H1 with my header for scientists. And then instead of just dumping all the list, item in, list items down below, I'm going to um, need to do a bit more work here. So I'm going to get rid of this. Actually, wait, I'm going to grab, I'm going to grab, I'm going to copy this, get rid of it. And then instead of just dumping in a UL, I'm going to have two separate lists looping through the arrays separately from each other. Um, so my first one, I'm going to have an H2. Or, you know, this could be whatever you want. I think an H2 makes sense. Uh, chemists. H2, sorry. And then I'm going to have a second one that's everyone else. All right. And then underneath my H2 here, um, I'm going to essentially just do my loop. Oops. Oh, dang it. I had it in the clipboard and I lost it. <laughs> no, I hate it when I do that. That's OK. Well, it's practice. We'll write it out. All right. So UL. Um, and then inside of that UL, um, the only thing about doing this in the browser, there's no autocomplete. So everything's typed by hand. But bear with me. So inside of this UL, we're going to loop through our chemist's array, right? And what are we going to, what, are, what method are we going to use in order to loop through our chemist array? What method should I use? Chemist.chemist.what? Dot, chemist dot map. Yeah, absolutely. And what map does by default, right, is it just loops through every item in the array until it reaches the end. And it does some kind of a functional operation on it. So what we're going to do here is for each person in our chemist array, we are going to do a thing. And so by using this arrow function syntax, we're just saying, all right, do a thing. Um, and I think what I want to do here is, I wish I hadn't deleted this. Um, I'm going to fork this into another window so I can copy and paste. I want to paste what's supposed to go in there. Uh, oh, come on. I don't want to reset it. Wait, hang on. I think I have it in my notes. One second. I don't want to type all this by hand. So the contents of this, okay, I have it. Oh, actually, wait, I think this was farther up the screen. I'm going to get it from up here. Is it up here? Ah, here we go. All right, so the contents of this are going to be essentially this. Yay, they reused examples. So it's going to take each person in the array, and it's going to put a bunch of tags around it. There we go. Yay, it works. <laughs> all right, so all we're doing there is we're just saying, hey, take each person in the array, wrap it in a list tag, get the image, get their name, and show their profession and their accomplishments. And so the, we only have two chemists here, but I think we have a couple more folks who are not chemists. So we're going to take this, and I'm just going to copy this whole thing. And instead of looping through chemists, I'm going to loop through my everyone else array. And thanks for joining, John. Or Jan, sorry. Thanks for joining. Great to have you here. There we go. And now as soon as I start looping through my everyone else array, um, I'm able to see everybody else. Yeah. OK, I'm going to check the solution here and make sure that's what they want. I think it is. Yeah, it is. Yay, go us. <laughs> so essentially all this is, it's just putting array methods into practice, um, using map, 
to loop through an array and conditionally and, and dynamically render as many list items as we need, um, you know, wrapped in tags, um, and put into list format. Okay. Um, let's see, I want to see how long these remaining challenges are. Oh, they're not bad. Okay, let's go ahead and keep going. So if there's any questions on this one, feel free to ask. Otherwise, let's go ahead and go on to the next challenge. So next we have nested lists in one component. Uh, so make a list of recipes from this array. Oh, thank you for the follow. Uh, hey, it's Simon. <laughs> hey, Simon. Make a list of recipes from this array. For each recipe in the array, display its name as an H2 and list its ingredients in a UL. So again, we're just practicing looping here. So essentially what we're going to do here is the same thing that we did before, right? They want the name as an H2 and the ingredients in a UL. Okay. Now we can see that our objects are over here in our data.js. We've got an ID. Um, we've got ingredients. Um, now this, so using this particular value, the, 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 using this particular value for an ID, I would say is not ideal. This is not how you want to do it. Um, for a little list like this, that's just an example, is fine. Um, these IDs are unique, right? But what's a potential problem that you could see by using these IDs, such as this, as keys in our list? What might happen if, we did, if, if our data was structured in this way? We use the IDs as keys in our list because they are unique. That's valid. But what's a potential problem with this? the way this um, data is put together. Mm, thank you for the follow, Dumdo. <laughs> what, what do we think might be able to happen here? Why doesn't every single database make their IDs, you know, match the name of the, the the item because that I mean that's easy to read right we can see that the ID lines up with the name but what's the problem with this why doesn't MongoDB do this Duplicate keys, yeah, that's a valid answer. So it's potential. So potentially, we might have. Let's say, okay, so this is like a. These are recipes, right? These are a name of a thing, and then we have the ingredients. But what if I have like the recipe for store bought hummus um, in my recipe database here, and then, but my grandmother makes really great hummus, and so I also want to put the recipe for her hummus in here. Potentially, um, I could end up with a situation where I maybe have duplicate keys. If I have two items that have the name of hummus and I always match the ID to the name, well, then I could end up with duplicate keys. Yeah. Um, what happens if I change the name of Hawaiian pizza to, let's say, island pizza? Right. I, I don't want it to be specific to Hawaii. Um, maybe I change the ingredients and I've changed this name now to be Island Pizza. Well, now my ID is still Hawaiian Pizza. Later on, maybe I add a new entry with a name of Hawaiian Pizza. I add that to my, I add that to my uh, list, right? Do something like, um, do something like, oops, oof. I do something like this. And I change this to Island Pizza, okay. And now I have a new entry for Hawaiian Pizza. And now I have two things. This ID still says Hawaiian Pizza. It refers to Island Pizza. And down here I have a new Hawaiian Pizza. So things can get really confusing, right? Really confusing really fast. Um, and so what you want is an ID 
that is still unique, but doesn't necessarily refer to the contents in a way where they might not match up later, right? Um, so yeah, that's why you probably just generally want to use the automatically generated IDs um, that are given to you by the database, because those are usually going to be pretty um, just random strings of numbers and letters. So yeah, that's just what's important to remember about keys is that these are not good keys. <laughs> We're going to use them, but they're not good. So I'm going to reset this. All right, but let's use them anyway, because they're not going to cause an error. They're just not good. So, so I think in order to loop through this data, I can use recipes.math. Throw them in the trash, yeah. <laughs> Generate our own, yeah. And for each recipe in my recipes array, dot ID, I want to return, um, I want to return, oh, okay, this is this will be interesting. Um, they said, I, for each recipe in the array, display its name as an H2 and list its ingredients in a UL. So we essentially want a multi-part return here. And it's not just an LI, right? We looked at a lot of examples earlier about just returning LIs. And LIs can have a key property. However, we saw earlier in our deep dive here that if we aren't returning an LI, and instead we're, we're returning something that has multiple tags, we can't use a regular fragment and we need to either wrap it in a div or use the fragment tag. So I think I'm going to use a div here because that's a little bit more straightforward, but you could also use a fragment tag. Um, so this is a little bit, a uh, little different than the standard example, which I, I, I like. I think this is good. Um, all right, so I think what I'm going to do here is I'm going to get this spaced out properly. I'm going to create a div just so I can pass my keys and loop through with a valid key value. So div, and inside of this div is where all of my, uh, my H2 and my UL items are going to go. And this div, in order to be valid, this div needs to have a key value as we loop through. So my key is going to be my recipe ID, even though I don't like it. <laughs> key is going to be my recipe ID. And um, inside of here, they want an H2. Ugh, I keep trying to do Emmet to autocomplete, and I can't hand typing things. So my H2 is going to be recipe.name and my UL is going to be, uh, ooh, okay. This is, this is interesting. So I can just, I could, let's just see if we can get the recipe.name to render. Um, and what am I missing here? Recipes. So we have our H1 and recipes.map. Oh, I see what I, I, I have my syntax wrong. I got it. Yeah. So uh, map, I just don't know how to write things properly. Recipe for each recipe. There we go. So getting closer, no more error. Recipe and then my div has a key of recipe.id. Uh, and then I need to put curly braces as drunk uncle grandma said, yes, I forgot my curly braces. There we go. Okay. So now we're able to display the name recipes, Greek salad, Hawaiian pizza, and hummus. However, they don't just want us to loop through the names. They also want us to list the ingredients in a UL. So how am I going to do that? Essentially, I'm looping through my recipes, right? 
And for the first one here, I'm grabbing all of this. And so I've already pulled out the name, but how do I list the ingredients in a UL? What am I gonna need to do there? How do I list the ingredients? How do I list all the ingredients in that, uh, in that array? not a trick question. Right, exactly. <laughs> we're going to use map again, right? So what we're doing here is we're looping through the recipes array right here, we're looping through the recipes array. And then inside of the array item, we have another array, we have nested arrays, right? And so inside of this second smaller array, inside of this item, we need to do another map. So we've already used map once. And then inside of there, we need to do another map to loop through the ingredients, okay? So yeah, and map is the traditional way. Yep, exactly. I think map is the best, it's so simple. It's just like, boom, do it, you know? You don't gotta worry about all that for each syntax and all that stuff. Um, or the, you know, for loop or anything like that. You could, but map is nice. Thank you for the follow of mirror codes. <laughs> All right. So let's just, let's go ahead and build our UL. We'll, I'll build the outer tags first, and then we'll loop through to generate the list items on the inside. Okay. Since we're working inside of a tag, we need our curly braces. Thank you, drunk uncle grandma. I forgot those before. That's why it didn't work. All right, so recipe dot uh, ingredients dot map. So here we're going into the recipe array, into the ingredients array, and then mapping through that. So for each ingredient in that array, I'm going to add the proper tags. So I'm going to add li tags. And our li tags need a key, right? And given that this is just a little array inside of, you know, inside of a larger array, um, we don't have anything like an ID or anything like that. So in order for, for our key, um, I think I'm just going to make the key be the name of the ingredient itself. Again, not ideal, but not a, you know, not a, cannot spell. I'm just going to copy and paste. Um, not the end of the world. So key is going to be ingredient. And um, inside of there, we're going to have the ingredient itself. And then I need to close my list tag down here. There we go. Okay, so we can see that we kind of have a double loop thing going on here, and I can fork this into a new, it's kind of hard to see. Yeah, there we go. That should be easier to see. So we've got our H1, and then we loop through our recipes array. Use the recipe ID for the key. Get the name as our H2, and then do a second loop through the ingredient list, list all of those out, and then, you know, go on to the next one. So we've got a double nested loop here and it's kind of wild. <laughs> and Mayor says, what is funny? I just came on your stream and heard you ask this question. <laughs> Coming in at just the right time there, Amir. Great job. Hey, Alex. Yeah, exactly. I think you're, I think you're exactly right there, Alex. Um, Recipes.ingredients.map and you're looping through that inner loop. Right, exactly. So again, we're using map twice here in order to deliver what we want. All right. Um, I do want to finish these challenges uh, and then we'll probably wrap up for the day, but I think the other two aren't quite as long. <laughs> you can choose whether or not to trust me. But uh, yeah, these, are, these challenges are a little meatier, but I think it's good to practice this stuff and how to think about loops um, and what loops can do for us. Because each of these items, I think each of these has the same number of ingredients, but if they didn't, that wouldn't matter, right? So if I took out, um, so 
I'm a vegetarian, so I'm going to go ahead and take ham out of the ingredient list for Hawaiian pizza. I know that's like sacrilege, but I'm going to go ahead and take ham out of there. And you can see that as soon as I do, when that re-renders, this item now has four ingredients while all the other ones still have five. So it's only looping through as many times as it needs to, right? I do love hummus also, and this is making me want to have some hummus because hummus is freaking delicious. All right, next up, let's go ahead on to this next challenge. I'm gonna go ahead and fork this because it's kind of hard to see. So let's see what they want us to do. Um, this recipe list component contains two nested map calls. That's basically what we did in challenge two, right? Nested maps. To simplify it, extract a recipe component from it, which will accept ID, name, and ingredients as props. Where do you place the outer key and why? Okay. Um, so let's look at what we have here. Essentially, we have what we did in challenge two, which is a double map. And it's kind of, yeah, it's a little hard to follow, a little hard to read maybe. Um, so I think if I were to extract this into a component, I would probably pull out everything that has to do with the individual recipe. Um, and then have it loop through and call the component as many times as it needs to, to generate all this stuff associated with the recipe. So maybe at the div, um, well, let me, okay. Yeah, I think, so I think the, this, I think this loop should be an outer component. And then this should be an inner component. Yeah, so Amir, yeah, we actually talked a lot about that earlier before you joined the screen, you, you weren't here yet. But yeah, we talked a lot about how unique, it, what keys are for and why they should be unique. And I think the question here is where should that key go, right? No, 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 you're totally fine, Amir. And that's, I love that you said that actually, because that just proves that what we're talking about is so important. The fact that you brought it up is that, I mean, that proves that this is freaking important, right? That, that was the first thing you thought of and you're like, yeah, our keys need to be unique. And um, exact, that this is what they're for is they tell React when to update the DOM and when it shouldn't. So I'm really glad you said that because you came in off the street and you're like, make sure your keys are right, <laughs> you know? So that's why keys are important, folks. Just proves everything we said so far. Yep. Active recall, indeed. Okay, so I think what I'm going to do here is I'm going to um, take recipe list and have that have H1 for recipes, because um, that's only shown once, and then loop through recipes and call our inner component as many times as we need to. So I'm going to take this out for now. For each recipe, it's gonna call that inner component as many times as it needs to. So I think the inner component, we can just call it recipe for a singular recipe. Um, and I can pass in um, the values that we're getting from each individual recipe. So that's gonna be one of the, that's gonna be one of the props I'm gonna pass in. Um, and I can pass it in. I'm going to use the spread operator on it because I want to essentially what I want to do is I want to take that 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 item and I want to spread it out. Um, and so all the properties are separate. So that's going to be one of the props. And then um, I think I'm also going to need to pass in the keys because we are looping through this. And React needs to be able to identify the individual um, instance of this that we are calling. So we, when we're looping through these recipes, I need to be able to identify which one we're looping through at a given time. 
Um, so I'm going to pass in key set to the recipe ID. Oops, what did I do? Okay. Key recipe ID um, and then close that component. Okay, it says recipe is not defined. That's fine. We're going to define it now. Um, so I can say export defaults. Have this new component called recipe. Close that. Um, oh, and I need to just uh, this is this doesn't need to be an export. Oh wait, function no, sorry. Let me put this up here. Function recipe. This doesn't need to be exported because we're calling it down below. So function recipe. Um, yeah, exactly, Amir. Um, so we talked before, um, we talked about also, you know, you don't want to use the index, right? And I, the React docs actually do a great job of explaining why you don't want to use the index as your key. Um, because indexes could be reshuffled, right? Exactly. Just like you said, Amir. Exactly. Yeah. And the reacts, I'm glad the docs, I'm glad the docs do call that out. That's very important. And so if you're getting data from a database, you're probably going to have an index already. And so you should just use that. Yeah. Or a key. Sorry, you, you, not an index, a key. You're going to have a key from the database. Exactly. So once again, listen to Amir. <laughs> All right. So my function recipe, we're going to be passing in. Um, recipe or not we're going to pass in the sorry the id the name and the ingredients as props all right so id name and ingredients and then we're going to return all of the stuff below hopefully that'll get rid of some of those uh squigglies there we go okay Pass that in. Uh, now our we don't know we don't need the key anymore. We're returning an individual item at a time, and we're referencing individual props here. So we can just say ingredients, um, and then that should do it. Okay. So what did I do here? What did I screw up on the name? Oh, curly braces again. Jeez, I'm sucking it. Remembering curly braces. Okay, Whew. that was a lot. So, but you can see what happens when you forget your curly braces, right? It just interprets that prop as text and it doesn't render it at all. So the first try. Hey, I'm gonna, I mean, for these, I've already done them once. Um, so don't think I'm just pulling this out of my butt. You know, <laughs> I'm just pulling this out on the fly. Um, it's okay if this doesn't make sense yet. If you're not good at this, I've already done these ahead of time. I've already gone through the docs. I've already done the challenges. I have notes on each of these. I try to talk through them while I'm doing them, um, but it's okay to not understand, right? I, I, and it's okay to be like, I couldn't do it that fast. Well, yeah, because it took me a lot longer the first time. This is not the first time I've done it. <laughs> so what I would suggest is going back i mean hey i'm not i'm not trying to be like the very best like no one ever was here i'm not trying to sell myself like some kind of like you know crazy react genius um what i am trying to do is you know show that it, practice is good and that it's um good to do things multiple times because you understand it better the next time you do it um so what, what i would suggest is you know looking at the answer if you need to um and then going back later and doing it again from scratch because that's going to help you see the patterns and it's going to help you see how things are broken apart it's going to help you experiment and try new things um, and make some mistakes so essentially now what we've done is we have our outer loop here in its own component called recipe list and inside of this component we're looping through our larger recipe array, and we're calling our recipe component as many times as we need to in order to finish generating the list. So we're calling this component, you know, four or 
three times here. And each time we call it as props, we're passing in whatever recipe we're currently on. And we're identifying this particular um, instance of that component with the unique ID. So we're, we're, we're helping React identify which recipe we're actually on by giving it a key. Okay. And then inside of our child component here, this is where we're looping through the ingredients and building the actual, uh, the, the name and the list. So this outside part is the loop that calls the component three times. And then the inside part is this part right here. Jay Barty, thank you for the sub. Appreciate that. And they subbed with Prime, so it didn't cost them anything at all. I like it when people don't have to spend money. That's great. <laughs> Thank you, Jay Barty. I really appreciate it. And it also costs Jeff Bezos money, which is a good thing on top of everything else. Oh my goodness, Bridge. Thank you for the sub as well. <laughs> Everybody likes not having to spend money and costing Jeff Bezos money. Again, that's the best part for me. Jeff Bezos should have to sell his cowboy hat before he can go to space again. My personal opinion, at least. Ooh. Ooh. That's a great question. Uh, thank you for the follow, um, Badshah42 and ID Jamal. Thank you so much for the follows, folks. And again, thank you for the subs. Um, thank you for the follow there, Ocean, as well. Uh, Awais asks, I have a pretty dumb question. No question is dumb, Awais. Don't worry about it. Um, these qu questions help us dig deeper into these concepts. So every question is appreciated, as long as it's asked in good faith. Um, I have a pretty dumb question. Uh, so is recipe list also a component? Like, is it also going to be used like recipe list? What, you know, calling it there? Yeah, so essentially what we're doing here is yes, recipe list is also a component. Um, and this just happens to be a, kind of like the parent component in this set, right? So we have a parent child relationship, recipe lists, calls, recipe. Um, however, it could also, you could also call recipe list elsewhere and it would work just like that. It is also a component. You are correct. Yep. Uh, Michael PC says, React sometimes complains that each item of a list should have a unique key prop. Correct. Uh, even if I'm not explicitly using an OL or a UL. So map default create default creates a list in a sense. Yeah. So essentially what you're doing when you're using map is you are looping through an array and doing stuff to that array, right? It doesn't matter whether you're creating a list, whether you're generating tags, um, you know, generating a bunch of H2s like we're doing here. Um, and let's go back to challenge two here real quick. Oh, oh, I took it away. Dang it. That's all right. Um, let's look at the solution for challenge two to kind of illustrate that. So in the um, instance of, let's show more here. In the instance of this outer loop here, we're, we're mapping through recipes and we're generating a div, right? We're not generating a list. We're, we're generating a list on the inner loop, but on the outer loop, we're actually just generating a div um, and with an H2 inside of it, right? And that div still requires a key because you are looping through something. And so potentially the next time that React loops through that, it might loop through it in a different order. You might have changed the array that it's looping through. Those items could be in a different order. Therefore, React still needs to ID them, have a way to uniquely ID them. You might have deleted an item in that array. You might have changed the spelling. You might have changed the capitalization. React needs some kind of a unique identifier for the items it is looping through so it knows whether or not it needs to re-render that item or leave it alone. Doesn't matter if it's a list or not. Does that make sense? Oh, and thank you for the hype train, by the way, folks. Holy cannoli, thank you for the prime sub ocean. 
wow, y'all are, y'all are showering me with some generosity right now. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hive train. Amazing. I, uh, I've only gotten a hype train a few times on this stream. And so it's, uh, that's wild. Thank you. <laughs> oh yeah. And if you just subbed, by the way, you get some pretty, uh, you get some pretty baller emotes. And so make sure to take advantage of those. I think they're adorable. Uh, I hope you do as well. <laughs> but yeah, so, um, <laughs> French love. <laughs> what the heck? Thank you so much for the sub. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Do you know if you do if you do decide to sub subscribe and you have Amazon Prime, please use your your Prime sub. Don't uh, don't spend your money. Do you, use your Prime sub if you have it, um, and so that way it doesn't cost you anything. But I, I I very much appreciate it. Thank you so much, Tropicana. Thank you, <laughs> and thank you for the uh, follow O eighty H. Don't know how to say that, but thank you. And Yorcha Dev, thank you, thank you for the follow as well. Um, but Michael PC, does that help answer your question? So it really doesn't matter whether you're looping through a list or another or something else entirely. Um, React just needs to be, identify where it's at in the array and whether or not it needs to update that item. Okay. And Vankercorn, dang, I don't know what's going on right now, but uh, I've got my uh, my my uh, my cup runneth over. I tell you what, thank you all. Okay, so we did challenge three already. Um, let's look at challenge four. See what they want us to do here. Ooh, something different. Okay, challenge four, list with a separator. <laughs> Good educational stream. Thank you. <laughs> that's, the, that's the best compliment I could receive. I want to, I, I, I want to, uh, I want to be educational and I want to be entertaining as a secondary uh, component to that. So if I can achieve at least one of those two, I'm happy, but preferably the educational one. <laughs> All right. So this example renders a famous haiku by Katsush Katsushika uh, Hokusai uh, with each line wrapped in a paragraph tag. Your job is to insert an HR separator between each paragraph. Your resulting structure should look like this. So we have an article tag and then they want paragraph separated by HR, separated by paragraph, HR, and then the final line. So what is, so HR tag, I'm genuinely asking here, um, HR tag, can somebody look that up real quick? And what does that mean? What is, what is HR tag for? Is it like a line, is it like a carriage return or what is it? Um, a haiku only contains three lines, but your solution should work with any number of lines. Note that HR elements only appear between the paragraph elements, not in the beginning or the end. Oh, horizontal rule. Okay. I knew HR stands for something, but it probably wasn't human resources. So thank you for that. Yeah. Horizontal rule. I'll try to remember that. For all your uh, 1995 uh, blog needs. <laughs> Before there was styling, we needed tags like HR. <laughs> Break string. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that kind of works, right? Um, okay, so we've got the lines here. And what's nice is that each of these three lines is in a separate array item already, right? So they're already divided. And so what I'm imagining is we can loop through them as they're doing here. They're mapping through them and they're putting them in paragraph values. I think Leon hates them like BR. Yeah, so the thing is with tags like BRs and HRs and all these different styling tags that we've kind of seen off and on, um, those do violate, you know, separation of concerns. Um, so it's preferable that you include those in your CSS instead or whatever other styling tool you're using. Um, so, I mean, you can use them. There's nothing to stop you, but separation of concerns, um, with that in mind, we should probably put this kind of thing in CSS ideally, but you know, hey.
All right, so I think what we're going to do here is map through them, list the P's. I think the challenge here is to determine when we could we could just add like an HR element to the end of this, right? And it would loop through. So it would be something like, um, just say, let's see, where is it supposed to be? Is it supposed to be after the paragraph tags? Okay. So we could do that. And... Oh, and I need to wrap it in a fragment as well. Um, so fragment. <laughs> Thank you for the hype train again, everybody. I appreciate it. Um, so I think instead of, if I want to return multiple tags, um, if I want to return more than one tag, uh, I need to wrap that in a fragment. fragment, and then my key is going to be the index. So I'm going to move the key out of the paragraph tag and up into the fragment. And then I can close that. So this isn't going to be exactly what we want right away, but let's just see what we get. Fragment. Okay. Fragment is not defined. Fragment key, uh, let's see. Hmm, why don't you like that? I'm not missing that. I wonder why it's not recognizing fragments. Okay, that should be valid, I think. Anybody see any errors here? With the way I've written fragment here? I don't see anything, but I've made I, I make mistakes all the time. <laughs> Uh, we can't in this case. Ocean, you're technically correct. The best kind of correct. Um, but uh, we cannot use... Oh, did I forget a close, close parenthesis? No, I think that's right. I don't think I did forget a close parenthesis. Um, so, Ocean, most of the time you can use the empty carrots as... Um, you can use the empty carrots as, uh, uh, as a fragment. You can use that for shorthand. However... Um, in this case, we can't, because if we want to pass a key value through a fragment like we're doing here, um, we have to fully write it out. The, the shorthand empty caret doesn't support keys. So yeah, that's a great call out because normally you can do that, but in this case we can't. So yeah, I guess I, guess I have to import it. So that's fine. Um, I guess I'll do my import statement here. Import React. So import reacts and then the fragment component from react like that. Oh, okay. Yeah, the error is that I just, apparently I just need to import fragment. Okay, so that's a good thing that I didn't know I needed to do. Um, if I needed, if I wanted to spell out the fragment component, I have to explicitly import it. And so that works, but it's not exactly the right answer, right? Um, we want the divider to not be at the end. So we need to loop through. What they want is they want the HR tags to only appear between the lines. So not um, after the end. So I think what we can do here is use some conditional logic to see if we are, um, what point we're at in our loop. Um, so I think what we can do here is conditionally render the HR tag depending on where we're at in our loop. Um, so let's see, if, Okay, yeah, so I'm going to change the order of this a little bit. 
Let's see what happens if we put our HR tag at the start. Oops. Private. I screwed that up, didn't I? All right, let me go back. this okay that's valid there we go okay i just don't now this is valid and it's never going to show up at the end so i just don't want the hr this this line to appear at the start so if we are on the first loop don't display the hr tag i think that should work so i'm going to do this and say if our um, index is greater than zero, then render the HR tag. Um, oh, why did I say this? There. So, uh, there we go. Okay. Yeah, that should do it. And then if I add another line, It's still, it's still valid. It loops through again, adds another line, but it's never gonna add the line at the start. <laughs> yeah, so now I think that's valid and it's always going to display the way they want it to. So we've sort of combined some concepts here, right? We've looped through using map. Um, we've used fragments to pass a key because this is because if we're grouping multiple tags together and multiple logical operations together, we need to, to wrap them in a single fragment. And so that's what we're doing, passing the key to uniquely identify that fragment, uh, and then using the double ampersand operator to only render the HR if we are done with the first loop. Whew, that was a lot, right? <laughs> I said the other ones might be easier and I was wrong. But that's okay. We got through it. Thanks for the error checking, folks. <laughs> Thank you for the follow. Uh, who followed? Uh, Lurkern. <laughs> Thank you for the follow. All right. So I know this is a lot, and I don't expect to necessarily, you know, everybody did necessarily digest all of this right away because we're combining multiple things together here. But does anybody have any questions on what we did? Why this works? or what it's doing, or why we did a certain part of it. I'm going to hydrate in a sec. I'm almost out of nasty fruit punch. Hooray. I still have half the pitcher to go, but I'm getting through it. All right, so what I would suggest is going back through this again later, after you've had some chance to think about it, you can look at the solution. You can do whatever you got to do to as long as you can understand what's happening. So I think that was all the challenges for this particular section. And so we'll go ahead and um, I think we'll go ahead and break it off here. We covered a plenty today. Um, most of what we talked about was stuff that is kind of familiar to us if we worked with things like uh, EJS in the past, right? Um, conditionally rendering stuff, rendering stuff uh, dynamically like lists. Um, I think the main new, you know, disregarding all the complexity of some of these examples, um, I think the main new concept was really the concept of keys, right? And with keys being those unique identifiers that react needs in order to tie information together, even if it moves around, even if the content changes, you know, like we said before, keys are kind of like your social security number. Um, you know, I could cut my hair, I could get a tan, I could wear different clothes, um, I could wear glasses, and I have in the past. I've looked very different than I do now. Uh, and so if you saw, you know, previous me next to current me, you might not be able to tell that we're the same person. Um, but my social security number never changed. And so that's, what Re that's how React uses that information in order to tie objects together, even if their content and their properties completely change. That tells React whether or not something needs to be updated or needs to stay the same. 
Same reveal says this stuff is essential for the kind of apps we've been building already with EJS. Exactly. No matter what tool you're using, whether you're using React or not, things like um, ternary operators and conditional rendering, um, learning how to use conditional logic to control what shows up and what doesn't, how to loop through arrays, um, that sort of thing is yeah, essential really no matter what tool you're using. They're, they're, those are fundamental JavaScript concepts. Um, and so very important to understand. Uh, and I think you know what we'll do once we're done with these docs is we will build an app that connects to a database and we can show how to grab those you know database IDs down and make these, these keys very trivial. Um, all you'll do is you'll just pass in the database ID from your document or whatever that you're pulling from your database and just use that as a key and you know, and that that's that's ready made for you. So it'll always be unique um, and it will always work for what React needs to do. Any last questions before we wrap up for today? I think I cursed myself at the beginning by saying, oh yeah, you know, well, we'll see how long we go today. Maybe not too long. <laughs> Maybe here we are 45 minutes after, <laughs> after that three hour mark. But I really wanted to finish covering um, especially these two topics today. I didn't want to stop. Um, so I appreciate you all sticking with me because I feel like it's really important. These are really important things to cover together um, because they kind of go together. The, the, the rendering lists and the conditional, um, uh, working with conditionals. So any questions? Doesn't necessarily have to be about this. I'm happy to answer questions about whatever as long as they're appropriate. <laughs> Not that y'all are, are great. You never had a problem with y'all. I love my chat. Hey, that's fine, Chris. I hope your project is going well. <laughs> yeah, like I said, I'm actually working on a React project right now, too. So some of this stuff is definitely applying. <laughs> And I'm actually using ChatGPT to help me with it. So ChatGPT isn't writing the code for me, but it's helping me with the tricky stuff that I don't, uh, you know, if I need, if I encounter a snag, I usually ask ChatGPT and it helps me figure it out. So it's been really helpful so far. Yeah, I've been using it for Roblox, absolutely. Um, if y'all didn't know, ChatGPT is actually pretty good at writing React um, and writing React components. If you tell it, you know, what you want, it will just spit it out for you. So. Also, um, yeah, Bing Chat is really good. Yep. Hey, Ocean. Uh, Ocean says, do you have a community? I do. Uh, in chat, go ahead and type exclamation point Leon, um, exclamation point L-E-O-N, and uh, join our Discord. It's very active and very fun. Yeah, I'm associated with 100 Devs, that community you might have heard of. Um, and so, yeah, I'm a stream team member for them. So that's our community. All right, any last questions? Best community, hands down. I would agree. Yeah, it's very fun and also very large, and so there's always something going on. Great place to learn stuff. Uh, Michael PC says, it gave me, so I'm talking about chat GPT, it gave me all the boilerplate code for basic MERN backend, and it worked after very little bug, bug fixing. Yeah, so Michael, if you're interested, um, we actually, a couple months ago, we actually did a, uh, we built a full stack MERN app, like front to back, HTML, CSS, server, um, all the Mongoose database connection stuff using only chat GPT. I, you know, and, and doing the same thing that you said, you know, minor bug fixes here and there, but really writing no code, just prompting GPT for the code um, and generating the full stack, uh, which is freaking wild. So yeah, if you want to know how to do that, you can check the stream there, but um, it's, it's, it's just so fun to mess around with. <laughs> Chris says, wish, wish you luck. I'm finishing the punch. My talking about my fruit punch. Um, it's stay, it's, it doesn't taste very good and it stains, you know, anything that it drips on. So I'm just trying to finish it. Frankly says still have foster kittens. Can you show one? I don't have any right now. <laughs> I wish I did. Um, but we just had our first really warm day here where I live. So that's going to kick it off. I already know I can feel it coming. It's like Spidey sense. It's every year around this time, 
as soon as the weather gets the slightest bit warm, it's kitten season. So it's, it's a, it's a coming. <laughs> Sirius says, I look forward to messing around with GPT-4. Yeah. So I actually am paying, uh, I'm paying for chat GPT plus. Um, and so I wouldn't say that it's, you know, I, I wouldn't say that it's, that everybody should do it. Um, I will say that it's nice. Um, if you, if you're interested in a comparison at the end of my stream last week, I actually showed, um, a direct comparison of the output from GPT four versus 3.5. So giving it the same prompt and the information that it returned. Um, so if you're interested in seeing a comparison without paying for it, um, feel free to check my stream from last week and, um, you know, and you can see a comparison of the type of type of results it delivers. Oh, you, after the example last week, you used ChatGPT to assist with an API and refining the copy for its contents. Absolutely. That's a perfect use case. Save me hours. Yeah. Getting good at prompting is a skill set people need to build. Yeah, absolutely. Practice prompts, see what you get. <laughs> Red 40, my favorite, the punch. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it is rather expensive. It's 20 bucks. Um, 20 bucks a month, which is a lot. Like that's more than any streaming service. Um, I know, right? Uh, but I, I, it, it was worth it to me because I really, really wanted it, but I, it's not going to be worth it for a lot of people. I, I mean, that makes perfect sense. Um, Sirius says, my plan is to get a new client and use that to fund a year of premium. Yeah, do that. Get a client, get a second source of, you know, freelance income and then, use that to fund it. Yep. Yeah, it's expensive. But man, it gives good results. <laughs> so it's helping me on this project. Um, I don't know that I'll pay for it forever. It might just only do a few months. We'll see. Um, but it's been fun to mess around with it so far. So it is such a great tool. Yeah. If you haven't played with ChatGPT, you don't have to pay. There is a free option. It's GPT 3.5. Um, it is free as you just sign up and you can play with it to your heart's content. I would suggest that everybody does it. Um, try having it correct your code. Try asking it questions. Just get familiar with interacting with the AI because this is where we're headed. Um, and you got to know how to do this stuff. So Michael PC asks, is ChatGPT plus better than Bing chat? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, Bing chat, you know, Microsoft Bing, uh, uses GPT-4 as its backend, as its brain. And then Bing chat is kind of a, a skin on top of it, kind of like, um, you know, Samsung has its own version of Android and they just have different overlays and, and behavior on top of it. It's a forked version of GPT-4. Um, so Bing, Bing is good at incorporating like modern search results because GPT-4 uh, on, on chat GPT only goes up to the end of 2021. Um, so Bing can supplement that with more recent search results from like today or last weekend. So if you want current up-to-date, you know, information, then Bing is, should be your go-to. Um, but as, at least as of right now, GPT-4 doesn't have that ability. Now that may change soon with some plugins that are coming out, but for now, uh, that's, not, that's not possible. However, um, I think GPT-4 is better suited to um, like long complex conversations, like generating tons of code and um, you know storing a bunch of context. Whereas I think Bing is probably better for shorter inquiries that are, that need to deal with current data day to day. Um, and I'll be honest, I haven't done a direct comparison between the two, but from what I've seen and read, I mean, that seems to be the case is that, you know, Bing is good if, if you're, if you want searching with context and have a conversation and remember context, then Bing is a great option. Um, but for those long, deep, in-depth conversations where you're generating a lot of content in return, I think GBT Plus is probably better for that. However, I would suggest trying it. Go to, go to Bing and have it write you some code. See what you get. See if it's right. Um, compare it against GPT 3.5 um, and you know, see, see what the differences are. 
Don't take my word for it. Okay. Yeah, sure, Michael. Yeah, that, that's if that's been your experience, then that's great because Bing is free. And so, you know, hey, anything that's free is great. Um, and so if Bing works just as well for what you're trying to do, then by all means, use that. Don't pay. And but yeah, uh, just base chat GPT is coming out with several plugins soon that will allow it to, to, to also search the web that will allow it to work with Wolfram Alpha for complex mathematical operations um, and just give it like a whole bunch of other resources that it can access, which I think is really cool. All right, let's go ahead and wrap it up. Um, any other questions before we go? I'm happy to answer. You know, I always like hanging out with you guys at the end of these streams. Bing and ChatGPT should have a combo. So what I've heard is that they actually have started um, so, uh, the various AI bots that are out there have started trying to cite each other as sources, which is really, really not good and dangerous, right? So not only are they spreading misinformation, they're starting to cite each other as authoritative sources, which is really bad. So we'll see how that goes. I'm not looking forward to that new age of misinformation. Oh boy. That's why we all have to be comfortable and familiar with artificial intelligence so that we know its capabilities as well as its limitations, right? We need to know what it can and more importantly, what it cannot do correctly. That's the most important part. People are out there saying it's going to be our savior and, you know, and put everybody out of a job. And the minute you use it, you actually use it, you'll find that it's really just a tool, just like anything else. It's not going to save us. But if you use it right, it'll certainly help us. Fact-checking sources. Yeah, I mean, that's more important than ever now, right? There was that image of, like, the, the Pope wearing a big uh, winter jacket that was circulating around, like, Twitter. And, yeah, that's AI-generated. That's not real. But everybody was thinking it was real, you know? Thank you for the follow, Jared. <laughs> All right, no worries, Ray Will. I'm going to be heading out here shortly, too. Okay, um, you know, I could talk about like AI and chat GPT until like, until I lose my voice, but <laughs> kind of got to wrap it up sometime. Um, but yeah, I always love talking about this stuff with you guys. It's so much fun. Uh, Michael BC says, here's a thousand word description of a complete full stack app. Here's the stack. Just give me all the code. Honestly, Michael, when we built that app on stream, that's basically what I did. Um, I just gave it a huge description of what I wanted specified the stack and it spat everything back at me. Um, yeah, it's wild. And so you knowing how to prompt and prompt well, um, can allow you to do stuff like that. And it, yeah, what it does is it gives you back. It, give, it gave me back the HTML, the CSS, a local JavaScript file for certain things, a server JavaScript file and information about how to set up all those files. And then information about how to store my environment variables and how to set up my git ignore file. It's friggin' wild. Yeah. Hey, little robot, welcome. <laughs> I love your little little dancing uh, little dancing animals there. You, you, those are that's a really cute emote. I like that. <laughs> Next casual stream win. I don't know, man. We gotta get through this React stuff. We got we're gonna finish the docs. Come hell or high water, gonna finish them docs. <laughs> I like doing little mini casual streams at the end of each of these streams. <laughs> so many docs, so little. Exactly. They're out, they're they're meaty. They they are expansive. Um, these docs are wild, and so we're gonna get, but we're gonna get through them together. All right. Does anybody have anybody have anyone that they would like me in particular to raid? Uh, as always, I prefer folks that are in the software development space. Uh, software and game dev space, although that's not a hard requirement. Uh, it's just a preference to kind of help folks get exposure in the community uh, and to share the love a little bit. Because so many wonderful folks in the software and game dev um, space have rated me in the past. And so we like to, you know, we like to uh, share that love around. Okay. Gonna get my raid stuff set up here. 
Yeah, we, we raided them before. We raided Vash last time. Oh, Morale Purr? What do they do, and Balder? What does Morale Purr do? I'll look them up. Okay, yeah, you got several folks on here. Uh, CM Griffin. Little Robot says, I'm really liking Leon's class classes. Thanks for introducing me. Oh, I'm so glad, Little Robot. I was hoping you'd take a look at that. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that, Little Robot. I'm so glad. All right, let's look at uh, Morale. Oh, they're doing software and game dev? Okay, yeah, it looks like maybe they're doing, uh... yeah, they're definitely programming something right now. They're building a software engine for a cheat engine? Oh, okay, that, that sounds fun. Maybe let's check them out and see what they're doing. <laughs> yeah, uh, Michael PC, yeah, I, I definitely have time and joy on my list. We, we raided them a couple streams ago, though, um, so I kind of want to, you know, spread it around a little. Yeah. All right, here we go. We're going to go ahead and start the raid and share some love with them and see what they're up to. I want, I want to learn how to build a cheat engine. That sounds great. All right, let's do it. <laughs> I will see you all back here again next week. Next week, we are going to cover keeping components pure, and then we are going to move on to the best part of React, which is where we join props and state and make our elements and components truly interactive. Um, and learn how React really works. So, so join me for that next week where we actually learn how React functions, the beating heart of React, which is state, and how props work together with state. Um, it's going to be a good time. All right, starting the raid now. See you all next week. All right, I'm going to enjoy it. go outside and enjoy that beautiful weather. But first, I'm going to say hi to Morale Purr and see what they're up to.